potentially AI systems, general AI systems. Um, so a learning loop could be very simple, something that uh, just has one or two steps where you have a goal um, and you take an action and then you kind of repeat this process and, and you try to move closer to your goal. Or it could be something that's more sophisticated where before you set a goal, you're actually mapping the landscape. And, and then before you actually take action, you predict what will happen when I take action. Um, maybe you test your strategy. Maybe you actually assess the impact of a, of a small pilot strategy before you actually grow what works and, and, and go to scale. And you could be also implementing continuous monitoring, scanning, scanning the horizon for, for threats and opportunities. But whether it's simple or sophisticated, um, I think that everything that is alive learns. And so I wanna kind of go, bring us back in time and ask this big, big picture question of when did the learning loop actually begin? And so I wanna focus um, our attention on this beautiful creature, the Stentor Roselli. Does anybody, is anybody familiar with S. Roselli? So S. Roselli is a unicellular organism. And we'll take a look at Mr. Roselli here. Um, so, you, so unicellular organisms existed for over a billion years before the emergence of multicellular organisms. So in the fossil record, we can go back to about 3.4 billion years ago when we first find them. Um, the center Roselli is a millimeter long freshwater protist that spends much of its life, as you can see, fastened to drifting algae and using cilia in its body to, to sweep food into its mouth. And so the, 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 there was a, a famous American zoologist named Jennings who asked the question in 1906, can, can something this simple actually learn? And at the time, you know, the, the, the belief in biology was that um, a, an organism this simple would only be able to, uh, to do very sort of rudimentary things. Would, if there is a negative stimulus, move away from the negative stimulus. If there is a positive stimulus, move toward the, the positive stimulus. And so, uh, so, so Jennings was curious, is this actually true? <clears throat> and sort of the deeper question behind his research was, do you need a brain to learn. Um, and he found actually that surprisingly, S. Roselli could exhibit a wide range of sort of complex behaviors in response to, to threats. Um, and he found that it was able to quote unquote, change its mind. So what does it mean for an organism to change its mind when it doesn't have a brain? Um, and how, how did he sort of how did he sort of figure this out? Well, he, he provided chemical irritants to, to this unicellular organism, and he watched it have sort of a range of different behaviors. This study was published in 1906. Um, it was later ca called into question. People basically sort of forgot it was lost to science. Um, but a team at Harvard Medical School in 2019 decided to revisit this research and and try to actually recreate this experiment. So this is actually what they, what they did. They provide a chemical irritant to S. Roselli, and they witnessed um, that S. Roselli, they actually confirmed Jennings' findings. The S. Roselli first sort of bends away from the irritant. Uh, then it tries to spit water back out at the thing that's irritating it. Uh, it might actually close down and, and contract its whole body. Um, before eventually detaching from its substrate and floating away. So, uh, and, it, and the last two behaviors, four and five on this slide, there's actually, they did a statistical analysis. There's actually a 50-50 chance of S. Roselli taking one of these two behaviors. So why, you know, is it useful to sort of have to be unpredictable, right, in your environment? Um, and so this really clearly showed that this single-celled organism is capable of making decisions based on past experience which is a simple form of learning. So let's jump forward in time. Um, and as we move forward in evolutionary time, our ability to learn gets more sophisticated. So what happens next? Let's add a central nervous system. <laughs> Jumping forward about 500 million years. This is, I have an image of the planaria. Planaria is the, the, the simplest living animals with cephalization. So this is actually a planarian brain. 
And what happens when you add a central nervous system is you get something very, very interesting. You get a new capability, the predictive brain. This is what biologists call the predictive brain. You get this ability to create what's called an efferent copy. Anybody familiar with this concept of an, of an efferent copy? You do it yourself, so you realize it or not. So it's basically an internal duplicate of motor signals of your own actions mapped to the outside environment. So it allows you to basically say, when I'm swimming in the water, if the water moves, was it something that was swimming past me or was it me? Was it, did I move my own cilia? And so this is really the first time in evolutionary history during the Ediacaran period before the Cambrian explosion, when uh, organisms have the ability to predict their own actions. This is very, very useful. And let's jump forward again. We only have half an hour for this talk, so we'll skip ahead a little bit further. <laughs> Another 500 million years, we get a new innovation, the neocortex, a new and improved processor. And really it's able to model more exciting, more complex things and achieve more complex things. So capable of modeling a theory of mind in dating, how do you ask someone out in diplomacy? What should my government say to say the president of China? And of course, also the theory of relativity in astrophysics. How do I get this thing into the orbit of a moon of Saturn, right? So we have more complex goals that we're trying to achieve. And so our ability to really take on more steps in the learning loop becomes more sophisticated as we add in uh, more complex tools. Um, and then I want to hone in on an important moment in history. We've been jumping forward to sort of 500 million years here, 500 million years there, but let's actually just pause and take, and take stock in 1943, 80 years ago, when a seminal work by Walter Pitts and Warren McCulloch was the first paper ever to create, to actually prove a, the Turing equivalence of AI and biological neural networks. This was a paper that, act, that absolutely shocked uh, the, his, uh, their contemporaries. So you may have heard of a few, a few guys named von Neumann, Norbert Wiener. This was really the very, very beginning of the field of computer science as we know it. There was a war going on. They stopped what they were doing, or they took time away from what they were doing to, to address the war. And they actually held a conference dedicated to this paper. There were 12 people at the conference, kind of like a small group like today. And this was really considered the beginning of the field of computer science as we know it. And we are still sort of seeing the effects of this, of this, um, of this work playing out today. So let's jump forward a bit further. Oh, and by the way, if you wanna see a little bit what's coming in, the, in this field, uh, these are a couple of our uh, AI forecasts on Metaculus. So we're sort of seeing this trajectory play out. Uh, these are a couple of forecasts that look at the um, evolution of artificial general intelligence. We have sort of a, a less robust and a more robust definition of what counts as AGI. So you can see how, how these forecasts are getting closer and closer in time. So February 2026 is the median for the less robust definition, 2031 is the median for the more robust definition. So this, so this is what we believe is, is what's coming. And so 80 years after this first seminal paper in the field, where are we today? So there's lots of research that has been making progress on uh, uh, AI systems ability to learn. This is what deep learning is all about. And the very sort of cutting edge of the state of the art right now, are these novel cognitive architectures that are combining multi, uh, multiple agents into a single system that's able to collaborate effectively. So things like adding GPT-4 or open source the leak of Llama with tools like Langchain that allow you to chain together multiple agents. So I'm gonna give just one example because I think it's really exciting. What can you do with a system like this? You can automate science itself. There's a research group led by the computational cognitive scientist, uh, Sebastian Muslick at Brown University that is actually um, in the process right now of automating first behavioral sciences and their next target is neuroscience. So this is very meta, right? We've been talking about sort of the history, the evolution of intelligence itself. And now we're gonna have uh, AI systems that are able to, to run that feedback loop even faster. So in this, in this architecture, 
we have a single LLM agent that is the hypothesis generator. That's what its job is. And another one that's the experimentalist, a third one that is fetching data, sort of cleaning data, a, a fourth one that is the data analyst that's producing analysis, and it's, et cetera, et cetera. And pretty soon you have a team of LLM agents who are actually a research lab uh, in a single system. And this is a paper I recommend checking out. This is very, very new uh, research. So they're still actually putting some of this stuff out. They've created a system called Feynman AI that you can check out where they've actually fed uh, a bunch of Feynman lectures to their system and they're able to do model regression um, and equation discovery and concept discovery to elicit 40 laws of physics from raw data. So what happens when you take high dimensional data and you can actually abstract it down into low dimensional data and learn from it, this is extremely powerful stuff. So phew, we have just <laughs> crossed 3.4 billion years of history. Um, and I'm going to update my original statement to not just every everything that's alive uh, learns, but rather every agent learns, because I think I don't really want to get into the debate about whether AI systems are alive right now. We can save that for the next meeting. <laughs> um, and I want to sort of hone in on what I believe the forecasting community's role is in this process. I believe institutions really need to understand and to leverage the learning loop if they're going to adapt to a changing environment. Our environment is changing faster than ever. So our role as forecasters and modelers is that we can really help to develop the capacity for institutions to um, sense the environment, to predict the impact of their actions, to foresee and prepare for threats, to identify opportunities and strategies. And, and I also want to claim that I believe, you know, there are different ways of learning. If you don't have prediction, if you don't have forecasting and assessment, you actually have an open loop system and you need to have a closed loop system. Only when you really close the, the, the loop do you get true adaptability. Um, so I think sort of broadly what we want as institutions, as agents that can, are capable of learning is we really want to be able to reliably run the entire learning loop. Of course, in our community, we focus on prediction as a core driver, and we want to do so in an efficient and in a coordinated way that leverages the knowledge and preferences of groups of people at various scales. So this is super, super big picture, but this is, I believe, what we're, um, uh, what we're doing as a community. Metaculous, we approach this in several ways. So we build software tools that enable collective intelligence and quantitative analysis. We run workshops that leverage qualitative methodologies to put the learning loop in context. Um, we really foster communities and coalitions like this, like today. And we, we partner with nonprofits, research teams, and government agencies in our work. This is what Metaculous looks like. If you aren't familiar with our platform, this is what Metaculous.com looks like. We do some unique things like conditional forecasts, which are very useful if you want to predict the impact of an action before you take it, right? So condition on taking an action, in this case, compute restrictions, what will be the impact in the landscape of AI? Um, so this is, again, we're global, a global hub for the, for the forecasting community to sort of maps our, our trajectory since 2015. Um, and we're a PDC, so we are committed to fostering the learning, the growth, the development of the forecasting community, which is really what today is all about. Um, we're folk, we are committed to supporting stakeholders who are serving the public good. Um, and uh, we're committed to increasing public access to information, public access to, to forecast through our platform. Um, we have a few key areas that we focus on. We work a lot on biosecurity, AI, as you've seen, uh, nuclear uh, security and climate. And you'll hear a little bit about some of these different areas today. Um, and again, we're really focused on growing the, the, the forecasting ecosystem. So these are some of our partners, some of whom are with us today. We're really excited to have VDH, FAS, and UVA uh, in, our, in the audience. Um, and we're excited to sort of be continuing to grow, grow this community. Um, I'm actually gonna save this. I'll talk a little bit, we'll talk like throughout the day about how we're thinking about forecasting and really being explicit as part of how, how it fits into the, into the, the learning loop. Um, so since I've talked a lot about AI, you may have the question, what about using AI 
to improve our learning loop and forecasting itself? Well, that is a great question. I'm so glad you asked. We're gonna come back to that uh, at, at later at the end of the day today. Um, and you know, today is really about, again, sort of connecting the community. I really hope that everyone here can learn about each other's work, can, can learn and understand each other's needs. Um, and also uh, by the end of the day today, I hope that we can come out of today under, getting a better understanding from each other about what might we want from a community of practice like this. Is this useful? How do we want to leverage this community? So thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it back to you, Peter, to introduce our next speaker. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gaia. Uh, this is why I'm, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm excited to work at Metaculus. Gaia, like, told me what she was going to talk about. And what I heard was, I'm going to start with an amoeba. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm not sure it's going to really hit with the audience. And then, of course, she spins it into something that is enormously uh, important in terms of, of learning loops. And, and, and something that, you know, I often think about, which is, I am interested in forecasting for the sake of forecasting. I just think it's interesting. Um, I, I like the idea of getting like an illicit peek at the future. Um, but ultimately what we're trying to do, especially when we talk about policymaking, is bring these anticipations of the future back to decisions that we are making today so that we can make and craft more effective policy. Um, so it is very much a loop. And of course, our, our decisions then impact our, our future, our, our estimates of the, the future again. So on, on that note, let me um, pass the mic to our next speaker, um, Rob Lempert. Um, Rob is, is at Rand where he wears at, at least three hats and I will try to try to get them right. He is the director of the Frederick Pardee Center for Longer Range Global Policy and the future human condition. He's also a principal researcher there, as well as being a professor of policy analysis at the Party Rand Graduate School. Um, he has done a tremendous amount of work on climate, including um, involvement with the IPCC um, and, and is a well-recognized well expert in that domain. He also, and yes, I am going to pull out my personal copy, has written this book, Shaping the Next 100 Years. And this is one of these instances where um, one hypothetically may go through a graduate program, write a dissertation, think one has come up with something new, graduate, and then discover that someone was there well before you and has actually put it between covers. Um, so with that, <laughs> Rob, I look forward to very much to, to your talk, um, to hearing more about your work. The floor is yours. Thank you. Theater. And uh, great, let's see. All right, so I need to figure out how to get my slides here. Um, oh, there we go. All right, let me see if I can get this to work. Is anything? Uh... Oh, great. Okay, good. And Fabulous. Okay, great. Good. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm going to give um, uh, context, um, I think, from another another direction, though it's it's actually um, uh, very resonant with uh, your learning part, though I'm not going to get to any uh, of the uh, single cell creatures. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, again, informing decisions um, um, and what under these uh, conditions of deep uncertainty. So Question, you mean, how do we anticipate the future when the future is hard to predict? I mean, among the many, many reasons we live in interesting times is um, forecasting methods are, okay, this, uh, oh yeah, you're right, all right. Uh, forecasting methods um, are getting much better. We've got much, many powerful ways to do that. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about that today um, in a whole variety of ways. And I'm gonna dive a little bit into that in a bit. Um, the future may be getting harder to predict, fast change, complex systems, and so forth. And there's also, um, and there's a bigger story, but you know, shaping the future seems increasingly important. We had, you know, for many decades, we did planning, and then we decided planning didn't work. And so we decided we would, you know, allow more market forces and just sort of, you know, uh, unguided adaptive systems. And 
kind of a little frustrated with that. And we're now trying to do something different. So we, you know, new challenges, hard to predict future new tools. How do we pull those all together? And so I'm going to uh, take you through these ideas of decision making and our deep uncertainty and suggest that they um, can enrich how we think forecasting can contribute to um, anticipating and shaping the future. So let me start out with um, what I think is a deceptively actually hard question, which is what is a good decision, okay? Um, has anybody ever been or raised a teenager, right? So uh, <laughs> seemingly reasonable decisions can turn out badly and bad decisions can turn out well, right? Anybody uh, have any personal experience <laughs> with such things, right? So, you know, you would like to sort of on average get good outcomes, but a good outcome doesn't necessarily mean a good decision. So what is a good decision? I mean, it turns out, I mean, this is a hard question. This is a list that we compiled in one of the last set of IPCC and a governmental panel on climate change reports on framing decision-making, but is essentially sort of an amalgamation of the decision sciences literature. And it focuses on processes as much as outcomes. And so a good decision is a process where people are explicit about what they're trying to achieve, uh, contemplate it from a wide variety, wide range of views and advantages, look at alternative options, use the best available information to try to understand the consequences of your actions, consider the trade-offs and follow some sort of process that whomever you're dealing with regards as legitimate and, and appropriate. So um, kind of keep this list in mind as now as I go through some of these more analytic questions. Okay, so um, for many problems and sort of often our model is that we're gonna go through a process like that by beginning with understanding, having a, a common view of the future and from which we can then rank decision options and sort of in the, um, uh, you know, decision science literature and sort of the, the um, uh, you know, the, the science of decision making, um, you can algorithm, you can show that, you know, if you can characterize the future for, with a joint probability distribution over future states of the world, and you have a utility function, then you can come up with a normatively good ranking of, of decisions. So often we do that. Um, we come up with our ranking, we might do some, some sensitivity analysis to see how sensitive it is. And so, you know, this, we, you can stick the label predict then act because you need this consensus understanding before you act. And I would say you never get on an airplane if the people who built and flew it didn't work really well in that mode. And there are whole reasons why this is a really powerful way to work. Predictions are the foundation of scientific method. That's how we adjudicate, you know, whether you, we're moving towards truth, demonstrates a mastery, right? And then also it gives you this normally correct ranking of decision options. And it's a powerful way to summarize a whole lot of information about the future and means and modes of um, particular distributions. Um, but there's a bunch of problems where this, you know, sole focus on that can lead us astray um, under these, conditions of deep uncertainty, which I'll define in a second. But among the things that can go wrong is we can be overconfident and end up with brittle policies. Um, the sort of focus on the parts of the problem that we can predict, leave aside the parts that are really squishy, but maybe just as important, so we can skew. Um, um, I didn't put on this slide, but you know, it, it, there's this whole dynamic of um, how uncertainty plays out in policy debates where it can lead to gridlock that a, a, uh, a policy is predicated on a forecast. You don't like the policy, so you attack the forecast. Um, and then this idea that um, it can misallocate resources from the idea, which is often the main task of seeking creative solutions under uncertainty. Um, the sort of problem where these uh, challenges, where these problems can arise are deep uncertainty, which occurs when the parties to a decision do not know or do not agree on the probability distributions of our future states of the world or how uh, actions relate to consequences. So this is essentially the probabilities are 
imprecise to a lesser to greater degree, and this is essentially model conservation. So, um, and then, you know, the claim is that deep uncertainty is increasingly relevant to policy decisions we find important. Um, there's this idea of uh, complex and cascading risks. This has uh, become an increasing issue in the, in the climate sphere, but it's, it's obviously shows up in a lot of other places, but you know, risk can aggregate. Uh, one risk can lead to another and they can cascade. Um, you know, that you have different risks and then they explode into a whole variety of these. So, you know, if you think of um, fire risk or climate risk facing electric utilities in California, the climate makes it hotter, it dries out the uh, vegetation, you get higher winds, it blows down the electricity lines into uh, forests, which then catch fire and utilities grow bankrupt, even though they did a like a great risk analysis for each piece of that problem. It turned out when you connect them all, the risks are much bigger than you thought. Um, then this whole idea of complex systems, uh, this is the Kinefin framework where you've got uh, com complicated systems, complex systems, and the idea is that with complexity, you can often understand a system, but it's hard to predict. So you can kind of understand the path you end up on, but you don't know, uh, you know, which one you're going. I mean, if you think of biological evolution, you can understand how we got to any particular place, but it's pretty hard to, to go from a dinosaur to a human and said, oh, I can predict that, right? Um, and, and then you often manage these systems differently. You, it, as opposed to sort of analyze an act, predict an act, you might want to probe and respond. Um, and then there's this classic idea, you know, which dates from the, the mid seventies of wicked problems, which are ones which are not well bounded, um, framed differently, different groups, different groups think of these problems as different, these deep uncertainties, nonlinear dynamics, and then the way you solve these starts to connect to this guy I was talking about, you know, an iterative reframing of the problem leading to clumsy solutions, which are essentially bits of clay from different worldviews that get all stuck together into something that is an adequate solution for the problem. Okay, so how can we use analytics, forecasting and other analytics in these, in these uh, types of situations? This is what this idea of decision-making or deep uncertainty gets to. And in some sense, it does the analysis backwards is that instead of starting with this consensus understanding of the future, we start with goals and plans, use the analytics to stress test the plans. How do they work in different futures? Um, and then use that information to think about how to make plans more robust and resilient against uncertainty. And in some sense, what we're trying to do is use the analytics to address higher confidence or give higher confidence answers in a world of uncertainty. So if I know what, I'm, what I'd like to achieve and how I'm thinking of trying to get there, the, the analytics can often do a very good job of telling you the conditions under which uh, your goals and actions are consistent and where they're inconsistent. So in the climate world, it's, it may be difficult to know how much the seas are gonna rise over the next century, but you can say with real certainty, if I build this facility this close to the coast in this place, how much sea level rise and increased storm intensity I can handle and how much I can't. And then that becomes a useful input into your planning. Okay, and so there's this whole, Emerging area of decision making under deep uncertainty. This is a book uh, from a couple of years ago that tries to collect um, this um, this field into one between two covers. Okay, so um, here here's another learning loop. Um, often these analytics are designed to fit into a particular sort of learning loop, which turns out to be called deliberation with analysis, which turns out to be a pretty powerful way to work with policy communities under conditions where goals and plans and values change during the course of the process. And so deliberation, parties define objectives, options, other parameters, you generate an analytic analytics, which supports that framing, that framing goes back and may recalibrate what people want. So it turns out, 
you may write down your goals, but then when you see what you can actually achieve, you may decide you can achieve more, you may decide you can achieve less. And so you go through this process. And the analytics here tries to facilitate this process. The stress tests yield um, scenarios, policy relevant scenarios, which in, as I'll show in a second, emerge from the analysis. And they're designed to illuminate the vulnerabilities and strengths of plans. And the, uh, these new plans are designed to be robust and adaptive, work across a range of futures, and can help stakeholders agree on decisions even if they disagree on what future um, occurs. Okay, so let me give you an example. There's some work some of my colleagues at RAND recently did. Um, as many countries, Costa Rica has developed the National Decarbonization Plan. This is their submission under the Paris Agreement. And so they uh, had a big elaborate plan the government put together to reach carbon neutrality across like eight sectors of the economy, carbon neutrality by 2050, and produce net economic benefits, largely because their transportation sector saves them a lot of money if they can electrify and don't have to import oil, and if they can um, uh, better manage car carbon in their ecosystems, it also turns out it helps tourism a lot, and so they, it, you generate net benefits. Okay, so we helped them put together a number of models. Oh, the upper branch kind of works. All right, anyway, so there's uh, basically, there's like macroeconomic models that look at macroeconomic futures and a bunch of micro models which look at how different technology cost and, um, and behavioral assumptions play out across a bunch of different sectors, transportation, electricity, buildings, manufacturing, housing, uh, various ecosystems, et cetera. So basically, we now have this scenario generator machine where you could put in a plan, you put in a bunch of assumptions, and you get an outcome. And so we use that then to scan over a whole bunch of different futures. And this is you know, several thousand futures, which are all a big experimental design over different economic futures. So like, you know, this is a fast growing global economy with a mid, -glow, you know, mid growth in Central America. And it costs this much to buy this sort of battery versus this much to re renovate this ecosystem. It's a whole bunch of, whole bunch of uh, different assumptions different combinations. And we plot them out as a function of net benefits to the economy and uh, total emission reductions. This was the government's baseline um, forecast. Um, and so a green dot means you meet your emissions goals at net economic benefit. There's a lot of green dots. Up here, you have net benefit but high emissions. Down here, you've got um, uh, net cost, but low emissions, and here you have that on both. And so this is the plan over a whole bunch of scenarios. So the politicians took this and said, oh, okay. They focused on the lower corner where there's a lot of points. They said, mission reductions at net benefit. And that's basically how they, they sold this, uh, which is, you know, not, not bad, but then there's a lot more information, which at least the tech, the analyst level, you can pull out of this. So the first thing is you can ask yourself, um, what puts, gives you a green dot as opposed to a dot of another color? Like, so what are, in this big world of uncertainty, what puts you in the corner you want to be at as opposed to someplace else? And so it turns out it depends on what sector you're in. So we did this for each of the sectors because it was for different policy audiences. But if you look at the transportation sector, you can run statistical classification algorithms against this big cluster and say, give me two or three parameters because that's all I can pay attention to and tell me the combinations, the combination of a couple of parameters that best distinguishes the futures where I get a green dot from something else. And for the transportation sector, it turns out to be those three parameters, which not too surprisingly are high economic growth, so a big macro one, and then sort of uh, you know the, the couple of micro ones on the cost ratio of uh, internal combustion cars to electric cars and the efficiency. So basically, how good are the uh, uh, gas cars versus electric cars, right? And if the economy really is growing like 
gangbusters and internal combustion cars are good compared to electric cars, then you don't end up with the green dot, at least in the transportation sector, otherwise you do, okay? And so this becomes then a scenario that the, uh, the politicians don't spend a lot of time talking about in public, but in fact, then the planning agencies can do a lot of thinking about, oh, okay, how do I hedge against this? Or what do I do if I get that? And, and then you can also now think about coming up with a hedging strategy, a more robust strategy, which often now are um, adaptive. Again, another learning concept. So basically here you are in the present, we're heading out to multiple futures. We can monitor the environment and look at different thresholds. And we can think about if we see those conditions coming about, how do we steer? What might we do? And so these are then often the form that you have. And then this, these scenario clusters can inform the choice of near-term actions, what you would do in those scenarios, and how you might switch from one to the next. Um, jumping to a different area, some of my colleagues and I have been doing some work in, in pandemics for obvious reasons. And um, uh, Gaia, you showed this, uh, you know, sort of the control loop. So here we're modeling different reopening strategies. Um, this is in California, but you know, as you come out of a your, your tight restrictions in COVID, we model each of them as a control loop and ask what sorts of control loops work well over a wide range of uncertainties, both statistical uncertainties under the, the, the parameterizations of the pandemic we've seen, but then also shocking it with a bunch of pandemic, new, new variants that we haven't seen and a number of others. And so what you get is we look at uh, I won't go into the details here, but you know, diff they're all adaptive, but some have constant stringency thresholds, um, but others have thresholds that vary over time. They basically start stringent, get less stringent, one just based on a calendar and the other based on how long the vaccines have been in, in, uh, in, in circulation. And what this shows is these are, um, multi-objective trade-off curves, trade-off curves here. And they basically show that one class, the constant are totally dominated both in the world that is that we're in and all these future worlds that we might go into that you shock is that the constant is always, always dominated and the other two um, are, are dominant over them. And so this is a, um, a structured view, we, uh, California, I think most other jurisdictions kind of ended up with the strategies which were close on the Pareto curve, but sort of by trial and error, as opposed to having this, this map of the types of strategies that work most robust over a wide range of uncertainties. Okay, um, let me tee up this question. I think my be helpful for some of our discussions, but so how do you evaluate this sort of decision support where you're trying to make people do better decisions defined in this sort of squishy way, process way? Um, and so I'm gonna talk about some ex, you know, experimental um, uh, tests of this in a second, but first I wanna tee up this idea that the decision sciences distinguish between two types of tasks. Um, um, one is a choice task where you've got a list of options, right? And the question is what choice, what's the best option under uncertainty? And a lot of the literature focuses on that. Um, it's a well-defined problem and, this, and you know, a lot of game, you, know, you set up a game and you know, which, which is the best game. But there's another task, which is the framing task, which involves defining a problem in a way that opens up to consideration thoughtful considerations, like what's the problem? What are you trying to achieve? What are our options? What do I pay attention to? Um, RAND is a place where some people stay forever like me, but a lot of people you know, are there and they go into government and they come back. And so we had one person who um, spent time at RAND and then he would uh, writing studies and he was a, a high level official in the Pentagon reading studies. And he would always say that when I read a RAND study, I really don't care 
a little strong, but what the answer is, what I read it for is how a bunch of smart people thinking about the problem organized their, their thinking of it, right? You know, how should I frame this problem? So a lot of policy analysis is actually about problem framing and not choice. Um, but much of, so much of the literature focuses on evaluating the choice tasks, probably for the obvious reason that's a lot easier to set up in an experimental setting than the framing task. But a lot of policy analysis is framing, particularly this decision-making under deep uncertainty is really focused on framing. So here's an experiment that we tried to put together to think about framing. And so it's called testing the scenario hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that decision support that employs scenarios as opposed to probabilistic forecasts will encourage the choice of more robust options under deep uncertainty. And so to test this, we set up um, a decision, a task, and then uh, built a decision support tool where a participant comes in, we had about like 500 people who played this, physically coming into a, uh, a lab. And so they're asked to manage a fishery, uh, balance uh, you know, the, the biological continuation of the fishery with discounted economic benefits. Um, using a decision support tool, one group got forecasts, one group got scenarios, and there's a constructed environment. So there's multiple objectives, you know, in, you know, environmental, economic, lots of uncertainty, including, you know, sort of shocking worst cases, um, and large and difficult to ex explore set of management options. And so I'll show you a picture of it in a second, but essentially instead of like ABC, we've got a bunch of um, uh, radio buttons that you push to construct complicated strategies. So the search space is gigantic. And about a quarter of the options perform well, meaning they mostly sit on a uh, multi-objective Pareto surface. And a very small number of the options sit near the surface, but are also immune to the shocks that you get in the system, these worst cases. Okay, and so this is a little bit hard to read, but this is, this is the scenario condition. And so you've got a bunch of buttons to hit the management strategy, so it's like different open access, cash limit, fleet size, individual limits. So you can pick a management strategy and whether I'm stringent or not. And then if you want to, you can click this button and do a monitor and adjust where you start with something and it monitors things and it adjusts to something else. So you can make your strategies a lot more complicated. Then if, once you got a strategy, you hit run and you get forecasts of how it works. And then if you're interested in it, you can hit save and it goes up here into a little chart where you can save the strategy. And then you can set slider bars to get thresholds on the colors so you can turn it into a stoplight chart, okay? And then eventually when you've worked on this a while and you have something you're happy with, you hit choose and then you're done. And so people spend about an hour fiddling around with this. They got paid minimum wage, it turns out. Um, <laughs> and, and what we found was um, the participants in both conditions explored the options similarly. And what different, this is scenarios and then the probabilistic forecast you got sort of a, you know, uh, an expected value um, of plus or minus standard deviation. Then if you ask for it, you could also see 5%, 9%. Um, uh, so the, the, the fan going out. So participants in both conditions explored the options similarly, which we never showed them the Pareto surface, but you know you can then take what they did and look at the Pareto surface and you can watch how people sort of explore the space. And most of them got to the Pareto surface relatively quickly and explored around the Pareto surface, but they chose really differently. And so in the scenario forecast, which essentially highlights the worst case, people chose the, uh, the one that traded a little bit of uh, optimal performance for a lot of robustness, a lot more than they did in the forecast condition. So it sort of changed the way people thought about it. And then we did a bunch of, you know, think aloud protocols at the end. What were you thinking of? And the scenario condition motivated people to say, oh, I was thinking about how this strategy would work over multiple futures much more than the other condition. So, they all searched actually quite well and successfully across this big space, 
but they chose, they sort of organized how they thought about it differently. Um, so, um, sort of a summary, then I'm going to turn to, to the role of forecasting, but embracing deep uncertainty can help empower decision makers. So it's like a daunting concept, but embracing it helps decision makers to identify lower grant adaptive and diversified solution. Here's, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the bumper sticker, but considerable multiple futures, not a single future, choose futures to strengthen this plan. Robustness is a criteria, make plans flexible and adaptive, which is also makes it more robust going to learning. Um, and then use analytics to facilitate exploration and problem solving deliberation, not to tell people what to do. Uh, my colleague, Jan Falkel at TU Delta, premature aggregation over futures and projectives is the root of all evil and decision support. Um, and so, um, and we can discuss sort of, you know, where people are using this because communication is a big, big challenge clearly, but you do find um, a lot on the technical side, you know, sort of technical level of organizations, people starting to get their really embrace this. Um, the latest IPCC report, um, actually, I think there's a really, innovative and nice job, but the working group one, the climate scientists report sea level rise futures with a, a PDF, a probability density function over the understood components of sea level rise, which gets you up to you know, about two feet by the end of the century. Um, and then they've got what they call storylines, which are the you know, couple of meters sea level rise with no probabilities on them, but a description of what you would see happening, best understanding of what you would see happening in essentially the Antarctic and the Greenland ice sheets if these futures were coming to pass. And then in working group two, which is the responding to climate change, you start to see a bunch of these adaptive pathways where people say, we're gonna start out like this, but if we see the things that you know, in the ice sheets that are indicative of much faster sea level rise, here are some ways we could respond. So trying to connect the science to, um, to responses in, in this fashion. So um, where is this deep uncertainty thinking useful, where not? This is a cube that we often use. Um, three dimensions. Um, um, what's the uncertainty like? Well, characterized versus deep. Then how rich is, are the decision spaces, okay? I mean, do you have a sparse uh, decision, rich? Yeah. You're standing there. I got to jump over the cliff, uh, you know, bears chasing me. <laughs> and it's like, jump now or not, right? <laughs> you know, that's a very sparse decision space, okay? Um, so the sparser the decision space and the more well characterized the uncertainty, the more you just get the best estimate probability distribution and do your thing, right? Um, the richer the decision space and the deeper the uncertainty, the more there's a potential payoff to looking really hard for robust options in terms of portfolios, in terms of low regret options, learning, responding putting together a constructive adaptive strategy. So that depends. And then there's this complexity dimension, which here means is, is just a heuristic for, um, uh, you know, if you, if you get a bunch of part, smart people sitting in a room and how well does their intuition understand the system versus actually using some sort of analytics to look at long causal chains that people uh, may confuse people. And there's, you know, great, you know, uh, uh, judgment decision-making literature that you can think even Nobel Prize winning economists and they can do like four or five steps and then they lose it. <laughs> um, so if, 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 if it's not that complex or people can intuit the scenarios and traditional scenario planning work pretty well um, as it gets more complex and if the analytics can surprise you doing the big point clouds and looking at doing cluster analysis can often be useful. But so the claim here is that Predict and act is served well by forecasting joint probability distributions over future states. Um, if you're in this quadrant, ranges of futures is useful. 
imprecise probability. So doing the probability elicitation, but paying a lot of attention to not converging them, but understanding the ranges and often conditional ranges, like, you know, it's, it's, it's very likely if uh, you start seeing the, uh, you know, some of the Antarctic ice sheets doing this, but the probability stays low if they're not moving, you know, that sort of thing. Um, thresholds for adaptive strategies, again, sort of the conditional paths, you know, like where, um, here are do different scenarios. What, what would I see? What do I need to see to go down this path versus that path? And what are the, you know, the, the, the really, you know, concise things to watch? And then um, uh, what's fun to do in this, and often you can play this as sort of, you know, human computer collaboration, but what are the unmodeled vulnerabilities when you're doing modeling that would break your conclusions about robust strategies? You know, what, what could I add to the model that would change the ordering of robust strategies in a significant way? So, um, thanks, and uh, it's uh, hopefully useful for our discussions. Well, are you willing to take a couple of questions? questions. Do we have any, any questions, or, or less, I will unleash my own questions, which, which may be for better or for worse. Okay. Sir, yes. Uh, and we do have microphones, but maybe for now, just uh, let us have it. Yeah, thanks. So I think it's a it's a really nice talk where you try and talk about uh, you know uncertain futures and try to adapt uh, with the uncertainty. So of course, you know this is a question somewhat theoretical, but um, how do you adapt to uh, adapt to behaviors that go along? I mean, you know, if this you recurs this game quite a bit, then you have this going on where you have a certain future, people adapt. That leads to a new future, and then people adapt. Yeah. Uh, have you folks thought about how you would try and represent this in the scenarios? Because we are developing scenarios for our work. Yeah. But this this issue of recursion arises, as you can imagine, where uh, outcomes can produce new new adaptations. Yeah. So um, let me answer on 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 two levels. Um, I mean, in terms of um, you know modeling. I mean, the way you teed it up sounds like an agent-based modeling question. You're looking for, you know, emergent behaviors in, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I tend to think of the game theoretic as, as you know, the, the, the behavior of the agents in the system, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you can try to model model these things and, and um, you know, again, in the climate sphere, people are increasingly modeling that. We've done some work in the decarbonization modeling, um, modeling that. And, and you, you know, as your question suggests, you see all sorts of oscillatory behavior and it'll be in one state, it'll settle into a state and then it'll jump to another. So, um, um, which um, at some level is hard to explain, though at another level, uh, you know, um, again, I mean, that's sort of what people, uh, you know, that framed appropriately, that's people's intuition about the world, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that um, you know, you, you, you get reaction and, and, you know, action, reaction and so forth. Um, but at a higher level is, is often the way you try to um, they take this analysis and, and, and this style of thinking and, and, and put in a policy um, uh, a, a policy framework and policy communication is try to move the locus of certainty from what's going to happen to what we should do. Um, and so we've got, you know, there are some instances where, where, you know, people really get it. And, you know, so one that I often quote is, you know, we're working with a water agency. Um, they're holding one of their public outreach meetings. People start you know, asking them whether they really believe the climate models inputs they're using to justify the plan. And they say, well, we don't really believe the models, but we believe the plan because the plan's ready for anything, right? And so you're moving the locus of uncertainty. And then you've got, you know, if, if they actually want to 
burrow in on that. You can say, well, you know, the climate's bad, we do this, the climate's good, we do this. But, but it's trying to move the locus of uncertainty. So, you know, it's like, okay, we know the system oscillates, but if we follow this set of policies, then, you know, we're, we're ready for anything. That's what you try to do. Anyone else? Oh gosh, I'm gonna ask a question. Okay, yeah, I'm, go I'm, for I'm, it. Yeah. Right, first to you, sir. <laughs> All right. So this is more of uh, trying to understand what you mean by deep uncertainty. I think yeah. earlier you defined it as when there is not a lot of agreement or knowledge of the futures and then what the consequences of the actions would be under such futures. Yeah. So is there a gradation where like in some settings there's disagreement, but like every, so uh, we've used like ensembles of models to kind of approach futures where it's not about knowledge, but like there is disagreement. And I, I, I mean, at some level, it feels like a gradation uh, from well characterized to deep. Like, do you, is it binary or is it more? No, no, it's not binary and, yeah. and it's contextual. I mean, the, the, this, uh, you know, Q tries to get at the, um, the contextual nature. And so, Part of the context is the um, um, is is the is is the decision space. You know, I mean, again, if you if you just have two options A and B, th that there may not be much you can do other than choose the one, you know, that's at, ha has the best utility given your your risk aversion, right? But um, if you've got a rich space, which we're trying to get in that experiment I showed you. You know, considering the uncertainty as deep as essentially a search strategy through, you know, a wide range of options can, can be very valuable. Um, it, you know, again, you can do experiments where, uh, you know, the Ellsberg urn, which is, you know, an urn's got 100 balls, some red, some uh, blue, and you know, the, you know the number of red and blue balls, but then there's some number of balls that you don't know what color they are. And so the, 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 the number of, of balls that you don't know the color is a, you know, a, a quantifiable measure of the imprecision. And you can set up games with an Ellsberg urn and you can watch as people switch from expected value to um, essentially a minimax or some of these other decision rules. And, you know, it, so we, you could take that as a proxy for when people regard the uncertainty as deep and not everybody switches at the same point, but there's certainly a level of imprecision where everybody's doing, you know, a minimax, a level of precision where everybody's doing expected value and then a range where people switch from one to the other. So yeah, not, not a clear boundary, but, you know, a spectrum. If I recall correctly, Ellsberg's dissertation was, was basically economists themselves don't follow the rational course of action when choosing the probability of her. From the <laughs> he, I, he, I, you know. Yeah, yeah, he, yes, yeah, he, yeah, that the, the, the standard axioms don't imply because people are adverse to adverse. the ambiguity adverse. and they'll choose a strategy which is robust against the ambiguity. Exactly, exactly. Well, maybe, so I, I would like to ask you one question. That's yeah. a, a, maybe a little bit a little bit basic. For context, Rob has a doctorate in applied physics. I have a doctorate in not anything remotely related to applied <laughs> physics. So this may be a very simplistic question. But um, when you are, are there situations or domains in which there, it's not possible to identify the key variables to the extent that you can parameterize them and generate the wealth of scenarios that you have. Where we, you know, uh, domains that are just so, more softly defined like geopolitics, where we don't have known laws of yeah. human behavior necessarily, vice the climate, which does operate according yeah. to meteorolog meteorological principles. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, um, um, in this, you know, in, in, in the DMDU world, there is, um, there is work, I mean, there's people, you, parts where you just do the full modeling, you know, where you model pieces, but, uh, but you can also, there, um, often you uh, try to get these other pieces with more qualitative, um, qualitative models, which may just be lookup tables, or as a, uh, often work with um, uh, uh, influence diagrams. 
So we've actually done, you know, geopolitical work where you just get a bunch of experts and you do a mental model elicitation, turn that into um, uh, Bayesian nets with, you know, imprecise probabilities or other mathematical representations of mental models, and you you play that uh, uh, back and you play that as um, as one way to do it which may actually be an AI frontier because I always played around with the idea, you know, can, can, can you use AI to extract people's mental models and then turn that into something that you can, a scenario generator? Yes, figuring out how to make explicit the ways that people internally think about the world is one, one challenge that like I think we all face. And one thing that forecasting does is help make yeah. implicit beliefs explicit. Yes. Um, and, and so yeah. uh, that's a great example yeah. of, of that. Um, we have time for, I think, one more question. If there's a, a, a last query, oh, we can do two, <laughs> oh, two. I think we have time for two more, so. All right, Aaron. Yeah, uh, so just kind of following. Um, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, so just follow, following up on this, and obviously, Rob, this is what I work on. Um, uh, so I guess there's sort of two parts to this question. One is the movement of complexity, like you say, from low to high on your, right, your, your slide there how often do we really understand the complexity of the system we're talking about? We're always surprised that there's yeah. some, you know, wrinkle or twist or a feedback that was yeah. never considered. Um, and that ties to, I think, the transition from the um, traditional scenarios to the quantitative side yeah. of, right, going from the models in our heads to some computational representation that can be manipulated. Yeah. Um, the relationship between those and how do you write, how do we reduce the cost and the time? Because that's the biggest, you know, limitation often on, on trying to use these techniques is that unless the models are ready to go, project schedules, analytic schedules don't always build in or afford the resources to, to make that kind of investment. So wh where have you seen success in trying to take that on? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that, that, that is, Aaron, Aaron can follow us, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that's clearly the big challenge here is that you get, I mean, you need some sort of model, whatever that means. And that uh, either you start with one and that kind of locks you in with the future of your system you're doing, or um, uh, you, know, you need to build it, which uses up much of the project resources. But um, so, I mean, to greater or lesser degree, um, you try to have some, um, you know, devote some amount of project resources to some sort of stress test. This is the last one I've got here of saying what's not in the model. And so oftentimes in the climate, you know, sort of activity, you know, you've got a lot of models of the hydraulic system and the engineering and the dams, and the, you know, the aqueduct. And so, but then you spend some time at least creating um, <laughs> qualitative scenarios for the political environment, the regulatory environment. So like, you know, reclamation on the Colorado River, um, you obviously need to run the Department of Energy and get that kind of political consensus to do something about it. But the underlying modeling does have a whole bunch of climate scenarios, a very, you know, detailed hydrologic model, then a bunch of scenarios, um, one of which the, you know, the rest of which has to do with what the future is going to be in, you know, these emergency conditions. And the federal government is kind of playing out like one of the scenarios is a, you know, is essentially a, a, a verbal scenario. You know, if we hit the emergency conditions, the federal government might do this, might do that. And they played that through all the models. So you do this sort of, you know, mix of different models. And there has been some initial work of trying to do a little bit more um, detailed behavioral modeling of the public. Great, thank you for that. And uh, final question. Sure. Uh, yep, there's a microphone for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. I was wondering how quantity and quality of data play into this. Is the right decision ever just collect more data? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. First off, yeah, um, and um, yeah. So collecting, yeah, collecting more data is often a good step. So, um, I mean, oftentimes, you know, it's 
certainly, in, in many cases, you need to make a decision now and the right way to do it is not to wait for the decision to go to the AMS. Uh, particularly for a lot of work with, um, uh, you know, with World Bank on, again, on, on timing and things, because data, the lack of data is a huge, huge issue. Um, and so you can sometimes use these tools as a source of value and information um, uh, sort of exercise. Like here, here's the generic, you know, watershed. This is a, you know, and so data that would tell us whether you're this type of system or that type of system um, would be immensely valuable. And this is the, the data. So yeah, um, ubiquitous monitoring. All right, well, please join me in thanking Rob Webber for uh, We now have 15 minutes uh, to take a coffee break. So I would encourage you to adjourn next door, uh, get yourself a beverage or a snack and, and take a chance to, to introduce yourselves to one another. <laughs> a good break. We are now gonna do a series of lightning talks. So quick rapid fire talks from a set of really fantastically interesting people beginning with uh, Joshua Elliott uh, from DARPA who's gonna talk about world building which is a subject um, that I am particularly interested in. Um, he has been with DARPA since September, 2017. His interests include modeling and prediction of complex natural and socioeconomic systems and how we can use computational technologies to improve aspects of science and modeling from data discovery to analysis. He has published widely more than 50 peer reviewed articles in journals, book chapters and reports. So without further ado, let me hand it over to you, Joshua. Great, thanks. Um, lightning is not my specialty, so I'm going to do my best. But um, uh, thanks very much, everyone. I really enjoyed the talks this morning and they were a fantastic setup for what I'm gonna talk about. So let me jump into it. So I, I, I manage a, a very broad portfolio of sort of machine assisted, what I call machine assisted sort of modeling analysis and planning of programs at DARPA. And actually Peter's question to Rob at the, at the end of his talk was actually a perfect setup um, for um, um, a lot of what we're doing, especially on this top row um about how do we actually capture the mental models of 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 human experts or analysts or planners um as they're evaluating complex systems and then allow those those sort of captured um mental models to actually be be leveraged as as computational or exploratory models in order to evaluate scenarios and further uh, improve and extend intuition in the system so one of my programs is called Causal Exploration in Complex Operational Environments. It's really targeting um, the use case of collaborative um, um, planning um, within the military, what we call operational design. Um, it's, it's really focused on the specific use case of, uh, of planning, which is a specific type of kind of uh, scenario analysis and, and forecasting um, that, produce, that produces forecasts which are known to be particularly useless um, but which creates uh, uh, intuition in the people that plan that enables them to become this incredible resource for commanders as situation evolved and they can come back and, um, and adapt to them. So we wanted to create a platform that enabled all of that really valuable information that planners create during the process to actually be captured and to, to build out different intuitions and scenarios. Um, uh, the, the next one is what I, is sort of machine assisted analysis. And here I'm more thinking about analysts from say the intelligence community or from, from, um, from other sort of expert communities. We've worked a lot with folks at uh, DHS and, and other places. Um, and, and here the, the use case is somewhat similar, but they require a lot more uh, expert knowledge, uh, expert modeling and data-driven things. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The bottom row are programs that are really about not just using knowledge and analysis in order to support improved decision-making, but actually being able to, to create new knowledge, to build new artifacts of knowledge, um, whether that's purely data-driven or model-driven. So D3M is really about automating the critical processes of, 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 um, of data-driven um, machine learning, whether that's for forecasting or analysis or any other thing. And then finally, the ASCM program, 
automating scientific knowledge extraction and modeling, which is really trying to open up the black box of scientific modeling. And I'll talk more about that. And I won't talk about AI assisted climate tipping point modeling, but that's a fun one as well. So I'm just going to start with uh, a quick overview of uh, World Modelers program. So the goal of World Modelers really is to enable um, these, you know, quote unquote analysts to be able to convert their mental models of of really difficult, sticky problems in complex systems into a computational analysis framework that can then be elaborated with data um, and, and, and can be to challenge with different intervention strategies used to evaluate different future scenarios, and then can actually be elaborated further um, by bringing in quantitative models of any number of different systems, whether that's hydrology or conflict or agriculture, or climate, or, or any number of different things in order to really build rich qualitative and quantitative um, uh, pictures of, of complex problems and complex environments. We've worked throughout the program focusing largely on questions around, um, around climate and climate security, whether that's uh, food security, water security, physical security, and how all those things are kind of integrated together. Um, we focused a lot on East Africa uh, during, during the actual research part of the program, but we've been expanding during the transition phase we're in now um, uh, broadly um, to sort of global scale analysis. And uh, I'm just gonna show, this video is really old, but it's the best I have now that's approved for public release. So this is kind of get a sense for what a workflow within the World Modelers platform looks like. So, the first part of it is basically about machine assisted mental model building right so the user starts out generally by sketching out their mental model of the system and then the machine uh, enables them to rapidly add by making suggestions enables them to rapidly add um, and build up these rich and complex models um, and uh, uh, to, to end up with these, these these very complex realistic models that hopefully capture um, a broad range of, of the system itself. So here you can see in a few minutes added a complex model to it. Now the next stage of it is actually these, these nodes are then actually grounded to historical data um, and then used to calibrate simple computational models which can either be you know sort of simple sort of systems dynamics type approaches or, or, um, or sort of Bayesian graphical models. Um, once the user then builds intuition about that, they can actually then search for data and models, high, high fidelity, high resolution data and models that they can then add into their analysis um, and, and evaluate. So this is an example of a locus model. Um, this was uh, during the, the major locust outbreak in, in East Africa that happened a couple of years ago. They can evaluate a wide number of different scenarios. Um, they can ask for new simulations if, if, if they're not yet available. Um, and, and, and sort of rapidly build up rich, complex, hybrid, sort of qualitative and quantitative analyses um, of, of, of complex systems. I think that's... Oh, and then, and then they save insights anyway. All right. So that's World Modelers. It's effectively um, a platform for analysts that treats expert data and expert models as black boxes that experts can come in and sort of wrap in containers and create sandboxes that an so analysts can use those data and models um, without, uh, within the confines of sort of reasonableness, exposing just the parameters that are actually needed for the analyst kind of problem space. Now in ASCIM, we really want to sort of dig in and tear open those black boxes and create, create kind of the tooling for for scientists, for modelers themselves, to be able to really um, improve what they do, and again to, to further reduce that impedance mismatch between science scientists and modelers and their ultimate customers, whether those are, are analysts or decision makers. The best motivation for this was sort of the the early pandemic and the explosion of different um, models and experts and armchair epidemiologists and all those different things, and just countless examples of where sort of modeling and forecasting and decision support um, using expert models um, uh, failed significantly. And not necessarily because our, our models were bad or our models failed. A lot of it was because the way we communicated those modeling results um, um, failed. We failed to communicate, um, you know, the, the uh, contingent forecasting and scenario analysis. Um, and, um, but a lot of them, sometimes they were, um, 
examples of, of model failures itself. My favorite example of this is the Imperial College example um, in which, um, um, you know, this model was used uh, to inform the impacts to the UK of, of the early pandemic. It predicted, you know, millions of people would die. The UK government completely shut down um, the entire country. And so people rightly said, you know, well, we'd like to see the the code from this model that was used to make such an impactful decision. And when they opened up the code, they found that it was, and I love this quote, a buggy mess that looks more like a bowl of angel hair pasta than a finely tuned piece of programming. I just think that's that's a great um, a great code. Any anyway, a great uh, quote. Um, there's a lot of problems that exist across this across this sort of workflow of scientific modeling, ranging from the way that we actually um, um, discover, update, and synthesize knowledge across the broad um, the broad array of, of publications and and model source codes and data as they become available. This was very apparent during the pandemic, where these explosions of papers coming out thousands a day, um, all the way through to the tools we use to actually um, update our models, validate our models. Um, and and et cetera. And then finally, the tools we use to actually build simulators, to build predictive simulators from those models, whether those are contingent simulators or actual forecasts, and how we actually communicate the complexity of of those of those uh, of those predictive simulators um, to to um, to uh, ultimately to decision makers or analysts that can use them for uh, for policy making. And really, you know, these same issues, more or less, not to such a degree, really pervade, uh, in my argument, basically every field, every domain of, of, of scientific and expert modeling. And so um, the ASCOM program, which has now been running uh, for about nine months, we, we ran it as a, as a sort of test program for a couple of years, applying it to early stage pandemic applications. And we kicked off the, the, full, um, the full program back in August. Um, our first use case is really is to continue that epidemiology pandemic response, COVID-19 kind of use case. Um, we've got some very uh, advanced prototype tools based on that. We're now transitioning, uh, we're continuing to, to work on the epidemiology use case, but now adding in um, a, a very, very different um, use case, which is, which is modeling of, of climate change and climate risk. Um, which we're going to be introducing over the next uh, the next several months up until our 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 next um, meeting in July. And then the plan is then to apply the tools um, to many other different sort of communities of practice we've developed along with the NIH National Cancer Institute, um, a consortium of groups worried about space weather, um, fire and flood modeling, you name it. Um, I only threw in one slide here that sort of summarizes the kind of um, the the uh, the goals of the program. It's not a it's not a particularly fast slide to brief, so I won't really attempt to do it justice. But the basics is we're trying to create really an integrated IDE um, that enables us to insert automation and technology and and uh, and AI components into every stage of the scientific modeling workflow, from knowledge discovery and curation, uh, extraction of models from code, extraction of a of, of equations and knowledge from publications through to the processes of modeling, model extension, model validation, model checking, and then finally to the processes of, of, of simulator design um, and execution, all in, in, um, uh, in effectively a, a low code or, or a no code environment. And I only have seven minutes, so I have to stop there. Feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email address um, if you'd like to, to learn any more or have any interesting ideas for the things we should follow up on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, do you have time for one or two questions? We have time for one or two questions on our end. Absolutely. Fantastic. Anyone from the audience? Yes. I can. Okay, good. Um, so you actually hit on, I think, a really important question here. And so often as modelers, we focus on what's the best possible sort of output that we can get. But your point about decision making is really what are useful inputs to decision makers? And oftentimes these are not well aligned. I'm curious just if you have any thoughts about how to better align 
modeling outputs or modeling processes with decision-making processes um, so that they have a stronger role in actually supporting the choices that we all want to see made. So the approach that we've taken is, is really to try and see if we can't figure out what are the, what the, the sort of the dimensions of complexity are in these, in these various different decision-making processes. And my, my personal sort of thinking on it is that it, is that most of these processes are really complex, like hierarchical collaborative um, things where you have experts and modelers, perhaps in multiple different domains that are supposed to be creating knowledge or data or model products that are then supposed to be, you know, raised up to let's say, uh, you know, an, um, uh, an analyst level or something like that, where they're supposed to be able to synthesize across these different knowledge artifacts in order to create you know, the kind of decision relevant products that uh, a decision maker can actually use, which might be an executive summary or something for the Secretary of Homeland Security that they can actually use then to make rapid decisions. And in each layer of this, and in fact, even within these layers, there are massive sort of impedance uh, mismatches um, that make it very, very difficult to communicate um, a lot of the, the, the key, um, you know, the key information and knowledge, uncertainty, and all of those things that we as, as sort of, you know, modeling experts and forecasters know are really essential for the decision process. And so, you know, ultimately each, each of those layers you end up having, are in, end up being very lossy information wise. And so the goal in my programs is to really try and create the kinds of tooling that can smooth out those impedance mismatches between those different layers. So that, for example, modelers are able to actually create not just static, data or, or knowledge products that they can hand off to an analyst or decision maker, but they can actually uh, create, you know, sort of sandbox um, um, modeling tools that, um, that provide, say, the five or ten or eight different parameters within the model that an analyst might actually want to play around with in order to evaluate different scenarios without the analyst having to be an expert in that model itself so that they can you know, set the other hundred parameters in the model to something reasonable or so that they can, um, or so that they can avoid uh, pushing the model into a point in parameter space where it's going to give them a, a, um, a ridiculous um, result. And um, so this sort of translation, the sort of hierarchical translation of knowledge, not just about the sort of system that's being modeled, but about the actual, uh, the model it, itself and how you use it and how you don't use it um, I think is really is really kind of a, a, a critical aspect of it. Um, and then, you know, on the planning side, I mean, that one's one that I think is absolutely fascinating to me because, you know, in the military, we always say that um, the plan is nothing but planning is everything. And, and I've been trying for the last four years in my Kazakh program to try and push back against that and say that the plan can actually be useful if we didn't do planning on on whiteboards and sticky notes, but instead we did, did planning and computational interfaces where those mental models, those rich, complicated, and, and like incredibly detailed high fidelity mental models that these, that these really smart, brilliant planning teams create can actually become, you know, reusable uh, knowledge artifacts that you can use to explore lots of different scenarios and things like that. And then that can enable this much richer form of communication to their customer, which might be a commander or et cetera, who's got a situation that's rapidly changing on the ground and um, that static artifact is, is, you know, is, is not actually going to be able to address their questions. It has to be an adaptable artifact that they can constantly come back and re-query and reuse. Um, and currently they just use the planner's brains for that, which is fine. Our brains are particularly good at being adaptable artifacts that can be re-queried. Um, but of course, uh, a lot of things get lost and biases get introduced as part of that process. And so it's always useful to have uh, capture as a, as a computational artifact as well. Fantastic. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for indulging us with a lightning talk. Um, we all learned a tremendous amount in 15 minutes. So thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking Joshua. Yeah. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Next, are we ready? We are ready. We have Clive up next. Excellent. Um, ah, and I hear Clive, yes. Welcome. To, welcome, let me, uh, let me share my screen here first. Let me just take 30 seconds to introduce you, Clive, um, and, and say that you are the, the, the CXO of a number of high growth uh, tech companies. 
And right now are working at Precursor SPC uh, as a data to service to forecast earthquakes, earthquakes days to weeks in advance. And this I find fascinating because earthquakes, it's one of these things where there seems to me as a lay person to be a disjuncture between our ability to explain and our ability to predict. We can explain why earthquakes occur, but our ability to anticipate them is, is limited. So I'm extremely curious to, to, to hear about your work. Uh, take it away. Great, um, thank you everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, present. You know, the challenge of earthquake forecasting uh, has been elusive. You know, there are um, many, many uh, people and organizations over centuries have tried to forecast earthquakes um, with, uh, uh, with, you know, considerable uncertainty. Um, and that is still the case today. You have 25 to 100 year hazard models that tell you something big is gonna happen sometime in the future in some place in California, which is not particularly actionable. And then you have, you know, on the other extreme, you have um, early warning systems like shake alert in California, which tell you, you know, 10 to 30 seconds after the quake happened that um, something has, um, nope. Uh, that something has happened, um, or some that 10, 10, 10, 10 to 30 seconds after the quake has happened, that you're going to feel a shake 30 miles away. Again, not particularly actionable. So we took the approach that there's this gap in the middle um, on, on what we refer to as a human time scale, where you can uh, develop. Um, insight into pending events by, um, by understanding two things. One, the baseline environment and how that, is uh, how that is being maintained and consistent. But the other is using data, uh, specifically um, data on what we call or refer to as earthquake precursors that will tell you uh, days to weeks in advance, uh, uh, imminent uh, or pending imminent events. So we use something called now casting. Now casting is, a, uh, as I'm sure you all know, refers to a forecasting current or near future events based on real time data rather than historical data. So now casting is a, is a very powerful technique used today in economics and finance, uh, used in transportation to predict traffic flows, used in health, obviously. And we use AI specifically to now cast natural disasters and the space environment. Now casting is very context dependent. So as an example, space weather, we can now cast the space weather environment and that now cast will be valid for two to four hours. We can now cast the pre-earthquake environment and that now cast will be valid for you know one to three to five days prior but what it does do rather than giving you that long-term forecast it, what it does do is provide you actionable information that ultimately we believe uh can save lives and and billions of dollars hey clive I'm actually going to yep. interrupt you for a second. I think you're sharing some slides that we're not seeing. So we're still seeing your cover slide. And I want to make sure um, oh, okay. that you uh, can you try advancing your slides so we can see your other slides. Fabulous. Now we see okay. an impact slide. Yep. OK. Yep. And now now casting. Fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Sorry. OK. Yeah, I, I guess I failed to hit it. <laughs> failed to hit the button. Um, Anyways, um, so today the death toll in the Turkey Syria quake stands at 57,000 lives lost and with thousands more injured. Advanced knowledge say a day in advance perhaps could have saved 10,000 lives. Three days in advance, maybe as many as 40,000 lives. A tsunami that would inundate uh, the Fukushima 
nuclear plant was expected. Three large generators powered three high capacity pumps that were designed to remove huge volumes of seawater. And then on March 11, 2011, the 9.1 Tohoku earthquake struck the fuel to power the generators in at least one of those generators had gone stale. Had they had information in advance, a warning a week in advance, they could have tested or run that generator and saved billions of dollars and prevented the radiation leak environmental disaster that we're still being felt today and paid for today. An even clearer one, and simpler one, we're now casting has direct impact in the 1989 San Francisco earthquake. One of the most significant causes of damage uh, was fire in the urban areas. San Francisco has many fire stations that could respond to these earthquake caused fires, yet the large doors in the fire stations twisted in the earthquake, preventing the responders from driving their trucks out of the bay doors. A simple notice in advance to park outside tonight would have prevented millions in uh, damage and loss. This is the power of now casting, taking that real-time data and using it as an actionable input um, for uh, these particular scenarios. So now casting, what is, the, what is the big deal with now casting? Now casting is, in our world, is really taking streaming data from base and ground-based systems as inputs to the proprietary uh, AI, ML. And the algorithms learn the environment based on the current and the baseline data while resolving all of these diverse data sets in real time to provide a real time high resolution representation of the actual dynamic environment. And that's key. This is that buildup of energy prior to the earthquake and the changing low earth environment in space. The output of these algorithms is space weather now casting and earthquake now casting. This is actionable information for government, public safety, and national security use cases. And in the private sector for utilities, high value asset owners, space operators, process-based businesses, and insurance reinsurance. At the moment of rock rupture, the Tohoku earthquake was the equivalent of 2 million Hiroshima class nuclear devices going off simultaneously. That buildup of energy coming up from the point of stress was measurable days to weeks in advance. What you see here is a view of the ionosphere above Japan over a 10 hour window prior to and after the Tohoku earthquake. The color increases from light green to red to illustrate the massive increase in the energy as we approach the time of rock rupture and then after the diffusion of energy. Using now casting, we've been able to show the changing space weather as an earthquake precursor. We've done this analysis repeatedly prior to earthquakes in Alaska, in Taiwan. We measured that real time buildup of energy in the ionosphere days in advance. We're currently engaging with a number of organizations to gather this data over the Turkey, Syria region to that catastrophic earthquake. And we're advancing a plan to put down this capability specifically in Northern California to provide actionable information to government uh, and industry. This is a now cast of an actual geomagnetic storm and the impacts of this space weather event has on aerospace, in orbit systems, and on national security assets. With space weather now casting, knowledge of the actual LEO environment at that specific orbit at that hour could have allowed SpaceX in February of last year to make decisions that would have resulted in a successful deployment, save millions of dollars, 
and kept projected schedules and business objectives intact rather than lose 40 Starlink satellites blind to the space weather environment. So earthquakes and space weather events are the deadliest and costliest recurring natural disasters that come as a surprise. We've been able to do real-time earthquake forecasts. We deliver real-time space weather nowcasts of the actual environment surrounding the earth. And we believe with this short-term approach to forecasting, we can have a significant impact on uh, lives, on losses, um, and you know, one of the reasons why I was very attracted to uh, presenting here today is making use of the now casting or using now casting capability for government decision making and government policy makers, because I, I don't think it has received the um, the attention that that maybe or the contribution that it can deliver um, for those audiences. So that's uh, that's it. I'm trying to blaze through this. So thank you. Thank you very much for blazing live. Um, we, we have a few minutes and I just wanted to follow up on your final comments about it, it, these, the, the impact or utility of now casting and forecasting not being received perhaps as, as well as it could. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have explanations for that or thoughts on, on why that is. Um, you know, I, I there, certainly think it is context uh, dependent. There's a long history of now casting in economics and finance um, and in um, you know, localized uh, healthcare initiatives for things like uh, uh, space weather and earthquakes where the, um, you know, many have said it's, uh, it's impossible to forecast earthquakes. Um, you know, it's a very complex system with you know, many, many uh, degrees of uncertainty. And I think the reason uh, that, if you will, uh, bias or that, uh, that thinking is, uh, has maybe caused people to, to question uh, advances that are very useful and can move them forward. So I think it's really just about familiarity with new approaches and new thinking. Um, that can contribute to uh, to solving these challenges. Fantastic, thank you. Um, let's open it up for Q and A. We have a few minutes. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Great. Um, Clive. Uh, yeah. No, thanks. That was, that was great. And as someone who lives in Southern California, very interested in earthquake forecasts. Uh, for, for just super quick comments that, I mean, I think the long range and the very short range are actionable with building codes and where you stand in the 10 seconds you've got, though obviously the, the day out forecasts um, seem also super useful. Um, but um, could you summarize super quick? I mean, um, uh, I thought one problem with earthquake forecasts is we just don't have, a, you know, there's a lot of not of instances. I mean, had the amoebas that the guy had talked about start collecting data a billion years ago, we would have the proper time series for the big earthquakes. But I mean, how, so how do you, what, what's the sort of secret sauce that gets you around the very low end with um, big earthquakes? Um, yeah, it's really looking at the, 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 the problem quite differently. So, you know, tra traditional approaches, which are, you know, still being played out today, catalog seismic events, um, and, you know, apply a stochastic distribution to that, uh, those cataloged events in specific, uh, seismically active areas and use that for, it, um, for forecasting and thinking. We're not looking at the mechanical event after rock rupture. What we're looking at is specifically that buildup of energy that precedes an earthquake. And that's present all the time. So once you understand that baseline, there's a baseline level of energy. And then as the plates come together, that creates that stress, creates a source of increased, dramatically increased electromagnetic uh, energy. And that energy emanates from that point of stress 
to the surface of the earth and as I showed into the ionosphere. So it's looking at the problem differently rather than looking at the event, look at what's happening before the event. Clear, you know, validated the hundreds, thousands of times, there is a massive buildup of energy in order to create this rock rupture and earthquake. So we can measure that. We can measure that energy. So rather than just measure the event, measure the energy. Um, and that gives you a continuous stream of input data from which you can make very, very high confidence um, forecasts or now casts. Other questions? Yes. Hi, Clive. Thanks so much for the talk. I'm Marita Zimmerman from the Institute for Disease Modeling. Um, related to your last point, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your vision would be for the audience, how you, who you want to find and how you want to communicate with them, and perhaps relatedly, if any of your modeling will be open source? Um, you know, you know our, our goal obviously is to provide um, actionable information that can be useful to, to government's industry. And um, ultimately we see, you know, some collaboration between the, if you will, the, the forecasters and the now casters to provide very, very um, higher confidence, longer range uh, insights into that evolving environment, that evolving earth system. So, you know, we're uh, working with some government agencies to try to advance that. We're also working heavily in the insurance and uh, reinsurance industries um, because they are directly economically affected. So th that's kind of the approach in terms of how we're trying to advance broadly uh, this this thinking and uh, incorporated that into in turn these organizations um, thinking that is uh, that that's our that's kind of our plan. And I think there was a second part of your question. Sorry, I didn't answer. Um, if you could repeat it again. If your modeling is open source, Clive. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, at the moment, our modeling is not open open source. Um, we certainly see that as the path uh, we would move towards. Um, you know, in, in, all, in all of these systems, whether it's, you know, what we're doing and others are doing, you know, the key is really the data capture, right? The, the modeling, you know, can be uh, you know, very sophisticated and, you know, you can aggregate different models and it becomes very, very powerful. But the key to all of it is the data capture. Um, and now with advances in uh, different data capture techniques, in our case, satellites, ground sensors, and other things, uh, just building more and more appropriate data capture, um, we think will be the key to then um, opening up those data sets for others to, you know, uh, to deliver advanced models or to build on our model or to build on a bunch of models. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Clive. I know it was brief, but we learned a tremendous amount. Very much appreciated. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking Clive Cook. Thank you. Um, so now we are going to go off Zoom. We are going to uh, come back for our next lightning talk in person. And it is uh, to my pleasure to introduce Alice Wu, um, who is going to talk about conditional forecasting. She's an endless frontier fellow in science policy, working on climate and meta science policy. Comes from an academic research background in solar cells and nanotech. She has worked on projects around the world. So very excited to hear from you. Please, the floor is yours. All right. Alice. OK, hello, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking about forecasting climate tipping points. Um, very briefly, I'm going to try to introduce you, to you guys the concept of climate tipping points. You all are probably familiar with like the negative version of climate tipping points. This refers to um, 
uh, major environmental events that lead to drastic, difficult to reverse consequences downstream and really exacerbate the pace of climate change. Um, and the thing that drives these negative tipping points and their like power is something called feedback loops in the environment. So I have a very simplified example here. As global temperatures rise, ice melts into water, water absorbs light and heat faster than ice. So the ocean gets hotter faster and ice melts faster. And you can see how this is a self-reinforcing feedback loop where um, it makes itself stronger over time. So just as these sort of environmental feedback loops can create negative tipping points that exacerbate the pace of climate change, um, researchers have been theorizing that feedback loops in our social and our technological systems can create positive tipping points that rapidly accelerate the pace of decarbonization. And that's what we're really interested in um, as like folks who are on the climate policy side, we're thinking about like, what are ways that we can get um, use policy to drive change faster. And so researchers have been looking at positive tipping points in a variety of sectors um, and using across a variety of decarbonization technologies. And I'll give you some quick examples. Ooh. Are you? Okay. I'll give you some examples of um, social and technological feedback loops. You all are probably familiar with a lot of these, for example, um, learning by doing the process through which um, Technology production leads to better and cheaper technology. Social contagion, which is um, arises through people's desire to imitate one another, and that's how sort of social trends and um, ideas spread across societies. Um, and then lastly, coordinating technologies, and this refers to how um, technologies often um, have rely on infrastructure or complementary technology and the deployment of one technology can support the deployment of another and vice versa. And so um, how do we know that positive tipping points are a thing? Well, we can look to history and look at um, something called S-curves. This is probably very familiar to technologists in the room. The, this describes the characteristic shape that technology that the adoption of new technologies takes. Um, usually it starts off very slow, not many people like the new idea. And then over time, as people try new ideas and talk to each other about the idea, and as these like technological learning loops and um, complementary technology feedback loops um, grow in strength, at a certain point, there's an inflection point and like adoption takes off very rapidly until it saturates the market. And so here on the screen, I have some um, historical S curves for technologies such as railroads and like electricity and the telegraph. Um, and so what we want to do is to move from this sort of historical perspective of understanding positive tipping points and S curves and start to look towards the future now. And why do we care about this? Well, policymakers want to know how do we put this idea into action? And to put an idea into action, first you have to be able to identify it out there in the world. And that involves a variety of tracking statistics and like trying to forecast these indicators of a transition. Then obviously you want to know what kind of interventions will work. And this involves a variety of like theory, modeling, and forecasting. There are folks who are in academia who are trying to do this. Um, and it's right now it's like very focused in the UK and the EU, particularly like the Global Systems Institute. Um, and then obviously the last step is you want to translate these insights into actionable policy. Um, so here in the US, um, positive tubing points is still a rather new concept. There's not a lot of academic research going on it. So at the Federation of American Scientists, as policy folks, we didn't exactly have the capacity to do very complex academic modeling. So we were looking out into this, the world and trying to see how can we start to put data behind this idea in a sort of cheap and lightweight method. And that led us to Metaculus, where um, they've been doing a lot of work on crowd forecasting um, and we, came to them with this question of like, can we use crowd forecasting to try to predict the outcomes of different future scenarios, particularly policy scenarios? Um, and so together we launched a collaboration um, 
which was our climate tipping points tournament. So FAS brought sort of like all of our eager questions from a policy perspective and Metaculus, um, particularly Ryan here in the room helped us shape that into actual forecasting questions that people could um, resolve. Um, so um, I'm gonna give you guys um, a brief rundown of what we tried to do in the tournament and the questions that we were trying to ask forecasters. Um, we started with some very easy um, questions. So we wanted to first see like, is our theory correct? Can we see S curves in, for example, the EV transition? And we asked forecasters to um, predict over like the next decade, uh, what would the light duty EV market share be in the US? And you can see that we start to see, we see that nonlinear behavior and you start to see it, um, the slope getting greater and greater, but we didn't predict far enough out to see the full S curve, um, but it gives us sort of like a, I guess, a promising first sign that we're like, I think on the right track. And then we also, um, because we're interested in like trying using this to inform policy making, we also asked for forecasters to predict um, indicators that um, policy would affect and that would then affect the EV transition. Um, so for example, what would be the um, trend in the number of public charging stations? What would be the trend in the um, price of critical minerals? So that's what the energy transition metal index refers to. Um, and for these plots, um, the medium prediction that we got from our crowd forecasts is indicated by the, the line. And then the gray band, the green band refers to like the 25th to 75th percentile. Um, and we did these predictions with um, both a public tournament that was open to anybody who was interested. Um, and we also did this with a, um, a uh, group of professional, um, group of what we call, Natalia calls their pro forecasters. So these are forecasters who have scored extremely highly on their platform and have like a track record of successful predictions. And so the forecasts that I'm showing you on the screen are from our pro, pro forecasters, um, since it's sort of the cream of the crop. Um, so now I'm gonna dive into the interesting stuff and the new stuff that we were trying in this tournament. Um, we wanted to do these sort of conditional forecasts where you have sort of trying to predict how a cause will lead to an effect. And we did two types of conditional forecasting. The first was about um, causal factors. So um, how might one piece of data out in the world um, affect another piece of data out in the world? So as an example, if the percentage change of the energy transition metal index is above or below a threshold of, for example, 55%, how would the ZEV market share change? Um, the second type of conditional forecasting that we were interested in doing was for policy scenarios. Um, so we asked forecasters to predict um, ZEV market share um, for the case of if a policy were implemented versus if it weren't. So in this example, we asked forecasters to predict um, the market share if EV sourcing requirements from the IRA tax credits were kept versus eliminated. And um, so we did a lot of these questions and this is just a brief sort of summary of the tournament results. Um, we looked at, um, so there's some interesting things here. Um, the first being that everybody agrees that critical minerals are absolutely crucial to the EV transition. Um, but some other interesting things were that forecasters, for example, thought that EV median range mattered more than the number of public charging stations. Um, and then we also asked about some hypothetical policies such as um, a cash for clunkers program to have people trade in their um, old gas vehicles for credit towards a new EV, um, which has been proposed, but not actually implemented, obviously. Um, so yeah. Um, that's sort of what we did. And we're now in the process of trying to take these forecasts and analyze them and try to translate them into like policy insights and work with policymakers to see how this approach might be useful for 
um, analyzing other decarbonization transitions and trying to plan policies around them. Um, so that's my talk. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I was curious uh, when you're talking about all these uh, past technologies, you're primarily looking at technologies that eventually came to full adoption. Mm -hmm. They didn't represent intermediate products and weren't necessarily ultimately replaced by something. I'm wondering if the forecasters are thinking about some sort of compound probability where they're thinking about whether we will reach full adoption of EVs or some alternative state of the world where some other technology would eventually supersede EVs. Um, have you put any thought into eliciting that from your pooled forecasters in terms of how, like what sort of mechanisms they're thinking about will lead to adoption and maybe eventual replacement by something else? Um, yeah, I can speak to this a little bit and I can also let Ryan speak to it from his perspective. Um, so besides just collecting forecasts from participants, we also ask them to um, give very detailed comments of sort of their, how they're sort of modeling the problem in their head, what sort of causal chains they're thinking through. Um, and so um, I don't know that any of them, we, I think we got for when it came to like asking about critical minerals and batteries, we got, um, we got forecasters talking about like, oh, the rise of like, for example, solid state batteries might change sort of the need for different critical minerals. Um, so I don't think we like explicitly asked forecasters that, but we got a little bit of that in like talking to them about their like commentary and thinking behind the forecasts. Yeah. Great, anyone else? Yes. Thank you. Um, were the forecasters given any base rate probabilities or any information that they could use or were they just given the problem and then they had to find out all the data or all the information that they that they needed? Um, we provided a little bit of context and we pointed them towards the data set that we would use, like the public data set that we would use to resolve their forecasts, but they were given free range to go out and you know, collect their own data and like um, consider various factors on their own. Yeah. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Alice Wu for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Dan Spikogny, who is with FP21. Um, as a foreign policy guy, I have been reading their reports for a number of years now. Very, very informative, thrilled to have you here today. He's been a foreign service officer and has also worked on the Hill for, for over 10 years. He's on the governing board of the American Foreign Service Association uh, and, and completing a doctorate at Berkeley as well. So a few things on your plate. Thank you for joining us today. I'm trying to rebrand Zoom technical problems as a digital commute. <laughs> So join me on this little trip on the DC Metro for a moment. You talk. I may, I may. Oh, you have the mouse. Using a mouse really helps. That's <laughs> the trick. Uh, present, display. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so hello everyone. I, uh, it's such a joy to be here. I've already learned so much. I feel like I already like wanted to update my presentation from what I've learned. It's really cool to be in a space where people are approaching these forecasting questions from really different, um, let me be nerdy. I thought I was like supposed to dumb it down and now I'm gonna like up it a little bit from different epistemic communities. And in many ways, I think of this challenge that we face as forecasting or forecasting advocates or, or fanboys perhaps. Uh, as an epistemic challenge, that our decision makers 
have kind of an epistemic framework. I think it probably varies by community. So I come from the foreign policy world where the epistemics are essentially what, what they say is foreign policy is an art and not a science. And we have very senior policymakers asserting it's dangerous to use numbers in this space. We cannot measure what we do. It comes from here, it comes from here. So I've been really engaged with, and this is FP21's work, to think about how to improve the processes and institutions of our government, of, for us, for foreign policy. So perhaps it's different in different communities that have more connection with the scientific world, but so that's, that's where we approach the problem from. That's, and this is FP21, we work on processes and decision-making um, science. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Cassandra, uh, she's the subject of a wonderful Greek myth. She was gifted or perhaps cursed, depending how we see ourselves as forecasters, with the ability to see the future, but to be ignored by anybody she warned of impending disaster. So perhaps we are Cassandra. Uh, she offers, I think, a, a powerful warning for forecasters who want to try to influence policymakers and warn of impending disasters or perhaps impending opportunities is a better way to think about it. So I think the, the, the point, my belief is simply producing great forecasts does not equal policy impact. So I wanna think about the models, the pathways there and talk about these as a group. Um, so just to, to put a finer point on this, this is a recent study from Samitin, Friedman and Horowitz. Horowitz is now in government, I think in, in the Department of Defense. They basically reviewed the famous Tetlock forecasting tournament in, uh, in the intelligence world. Uh, this is a recent, for, recent paper, worth reading. They, they found essentially the forecasts were entirely ignored by the rest of the intelligence community. Almost none of it really actually made it to policymakers' decision-making desk. And of course, like the Tetlock experiment, after it was finished, they were like, wow, this is really cool. Thank you very much. No, thank you. And really there's no, uh, but perhaps it's updated and I don't know about it, but there's really no forecasting effort inside of, inside of US uh, national security intel these days. Um, uh, okay, so these are just ideas that we've come up with as a team and in talking with our community, four models for integrating forecasting into policy making. You can see as we get down the list, and I'll, I'll go through these in order, we're talking about deeper integration of forecasting techniques into the policy decision-making process. Um, okay, so we started today with amoebas. Then we moved on to, to complicated three-dimensional models. We've done space forecast. I want to talk about my favorite technology, which is memes, how I'm going to use this. Okay, that's how we share information these days. Uh, so I'm dating myself a little bit here. This is Field of Dreams. The first model, the analytical model, is the Field of Dreams model. This is, if you build it, he will come. Uh, the idea is that we have communities that, you know, like Metaculus, or, or perhaps a Metaculus inside of a government agency that produces forecasts, shares them with policymakers, and hope it updates their priors, that it informs them, hey, pay attention to this, this is important, or Here, here's, here's some more insight for your... Uh, for your decision-making calculus. Um, I see the, the potential strengths of this model. Again, I think we can say potential, and this is just you know, our speculation. I'll, I'll go through that. Um, is that this is like the least disruptive for organizational models. This doesn't challenge bureaucratic structures. It's just, hey, this is more insight for you to engage with and think about the world. Uh, the weakness, on the other hand, I think is that if you're not challenging a policymaker's epistemological framework, if you're not challenging their decision-making heuristics, I suspect you're probably not gonna actually change their decision-making. Uh, maybe that's different in different fields where policymakers are really looking for insights about how to think of the future. In foreign policy though, where there's, there's really no clear variables to hook into, um, I, I, think, I think you leave a lot of opportunity on the table. One could imagine a policymaker cherry picking forecasts that they like and ignoring the ones that they don't. Okay, um, so Metaculus, we know. What does a policymaker do with this exactly? Interesting, useful, provocative, but okay. 
All right, so let's think about potentially a, a, a little bit deeper of integration, another meme from the matrix this time, maybe a little bit more modern, the Oracle. Um, the idea here would be that uh, you would create early warning systems within discrete policy making frameworks. So a, poli a, a, a early warning system for political instability, some of these already exist, an early warning system for nuclear weapons or nuclear conflict or for climate change or for pan pandemics. Um, pro forecasters would proactively scan the globe and, and alert policymakers, hey, this risk seems to be increasing or here are the factors that are driving risk, et cetera. Uh, the strength here, I think, is this in some ways makes real bureaucratic sense. Going to, we think a lot about the bureaucratics of these issues. I think this is important to get smart on bureaucracy if we want to affect policymakers. Uh, so, to go to the climate offices and say, hey, we have a climate forecasting team, or you can, you know, you can take this team into your bureaucracy. I think that that makes kind of nice bureaucratic sense. Um, the weakness here is that, again, I think that there's unclear policy implications still. So risk of nuclear conflict goes up. Policymaker says, yeah, you know, I kind of, I get it. Uh, and we're going to still do our best. So, so what's the what's the gain exactly that policymakers are are receiving from this forecast? Are they thinking it with the precision that forecasting that good forecasting can offer? Unclear. Okay. So here's an example from a project that I actually really like from the U.S. Holocaust Center. Uh, CSO folks know about this. The Early Warning Project it tries to identify countries at risk of mass atrocities or genocide to say, hey, we should probably put more resources towards this. Indeed, there's actually a, a process in government to think about how to match resources to risks. Okay, that's good. That's a good model. Even deeper. Okay, going back a little bit in time, Star Trek. Uh, this we think of as a policy evaluation model. So the idea here might be that policymakers would generate a suite of options to achieve or to meet a problem, to, to achieve a goal, and forecasters would evaluate the likelihood of success of those different options against the criteria they were given. And they could pass that back to the policymaker and say, hey, it looks like we can rank these. This is highly likely, or, you know, we, okay, highly likely, that's intelligence community language for interpreting quantitative probabilities. Interesting background. Uh, you know, this is likely to, you know, be effective. This is less likely, and this is, you know, this is this is a harebrained idea. I think probably a lot of policymakers' ideas are in like the harebrained space, or, or like policymaking by fairy tale. It's like, well, we will, you know, we shall we shall push the Russians out. It's like, yeah, may, maybe that's going to work. But have we really thought through carefully the causal mechanisms behind these policies? Is this going to achieve the great leap that we're going to need? Um, Okay, so the strength here is I think this is this is kind of getting a little more exciting. But to, this is this is going to challenge and ask policymakers to engage with some of the the causal mechanisms and the base rates and the things that drive forecasting and improve epistemics. It's going to generate more discussion, I think, with policymakers about why policy options are perhaps ordered in different ways. And might even create a little bit of an epistemic shift from policymaking as gut instinct to policymaking as something that we're going to need to de defend based upon evidence and, God forbid, even quantitative analysis. Uh, so this may this may actually build some some foundation for further investments into forecasting and, and uh, in the policymaking space. Uh, the weakness here is I think this is really challenging to think about forecasting getting into the policymakers turf. This is a real challenge to their decision-making authority. I think that that's kind of sacred authority. It's politicized authority. And uh, so I think there's gonna be pushback when one starts proposing something like this. Um, it may slow down decision-making processes, which is always in the foreign policy space where we're making a thousand decisions every single day and we don't have time to evaluate all of these. It's resource intensive. Okay, challenge. Um, a little just kind of quick wiregram, wire diagram visual of policy proposals, you put confidence or predictions on those proposals and how to achieve a goal. Cool. The fourth one, uh, this is from Homeland, a TV show actually about foreign policy, I, th I think. The analyst goes a little crazy, uh, a little John Nash. And um, okay, so the decision-making model is that 
uh, the forecasting techniques supplant existing decision making heuristics potentially that we should that all policy decisions are conditional forecasts if we do this then we think this will occur and maybe these techniques should replace the existing approaches I, i'm i I'm a, I'm a small d democrat i believe in democracy i believe in politics i believe there are ethical choices we're not going to remove that from the process ever but perhaps it should be built on a foundation of we're doing our best to invest when we're making serious decisions about how to intervene in the world, about matters of war and peace. We're going to invest a lot into those, into the quality of those decisions and the epistemics we use. The strengths here is this is potentially a transformative way of thinking about governance and decision making. Uh, I think the downside is that it's just not viable or realistic in the future. I, I don't think the research is there even to say that this would necessarily be better. There's, for instance, I think there's a lot of good decision making tools in the intelligence world. Um, analysis of competing hypotheses was like really hot for a while. Research on it lately says actually it doesn't produce better analysis. Seems good, doesn't work. So I think we're going to need to prototype and test our way to get to something that that would allow us to have the confidence to to bring these tools into decision making spaces in a more serious way um we're working at a project in fp21 i would love to talk more about won't have time but maybe offline to to build like different decision making tools as just a starting point on this side here is the policy memo that's kind of ubiquitous. When you think of policymaking, it's this, it's the policy memo. And it hasn't changed in, you know, since World War II. So we're thinking about what are the new things that a secretary or a high level leader might be able to put into the decision-making memo itself to say, no, actually I demand citations of evidence. I want probabilistic forecasts. And, and to start integrating that into the way that we think about the decision-making process, so the epistemic process of decision-making. Um, so I think a key, okay, so here's a grid, I can leave this up for Q&A of like, just some thoughts of strengths and weaknesses uh, for the different models. I just wanna say that I think the key takeaway here is that we need to think hard about how policy decisions are being made. Uh, and um, I think just getting forecasting right without thinking about how to pass these forecasts into an impact space is, is I think like that's the next frontier of the research and, and the, the political work that our community, um, I hope will undertake. Um, thanks. So I'll leave this up for a second. We do a lot of work on this stuff where we have these projects ongoing. If you wanna to subscribe to our newsletter, or email us or whatever. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, question, do you have a moment for questions? Yes. Yes. Rob. No, thanks. This is super interesting. Um, so um, I had a colleague at Rand who had been, you know, been on the National Security Council actually when, uh, you know, when the, the Soviet Union fell and, and um, then subsequently wrote a book um, basically motivated by how should the U.S. not get into an accidental war with China. But he went through a whole bunch of historical case studies and made the argument, this is not the language he used, but in the language of this conference, that you get the biggest mistakes when policymakers' mental models don't match the world. So like Napoleon invading Russia, expecting Alexander to behave in ways that Alexander didn't behave, the Germans thinking the U.S. would not respond to the U-boat war in World War I, a bunch of stuff the U.S. has done over the years. I mean, all these cases. And so as I was listening to your talk, I was trying to, I had that in mind, like, how do these reflect, uh, do, you know, pros and cons in helping decision makers make their mental models more in line with reality. I, I mean, any thoughts on that? Um, or is that too big sort of a? No, I think that's, a, I think that's a great jump. question. I, I, I like try to read all the research on what's out there. And I think it's a good theory and a good claim that it's a mental model mismatch. I'd be curious of what our validated mental model is to be able to understand when 
when the status quo mental, the wrong mental model diverges from that. You know, I, I want to see that in an experimental context. Very briefly, I, we're, we're thinking about undertaking some research on like describing existing epistemology, decision making uh, in foreign policy. A couple of claims. One, some folks think of this as the adversarial legalistic approach. This is like an old Fred Kaplan, uh, American government is about it's like there's too many lawyers and it creates enormous risk aversion. And the goal of decisions is let's avoid legal or security risks and reach a, a consensus decision that's just like passable for everybody. Another epistemological claim that I like, there's some research on there, is, is that policymakers think in um, analogic thinking. Um, th there's war, analogies without war or Analogies, oh, yeah. analogies at war. Thank you. That the policy, it's like, it's always the last war you're fighting. Ah, oh, this is just like Vietnam. Ah, oh, this is just like the Gulf War. Ah, oh, this is just like Iraq is, you know, is going to be the new one for our generation. And that that's kind of a mismodel, a, a mismatch in the model. So I think it's, I think this is really important for us to understand exactly the question you're asking. What are the existing frameworks or, or epistemologies uh, of decision makers in our spaces, and it may be different in different fields. And how do we think about improving that or helping that or challenging that in order to get to a, what I consider a more scientific or evidence-based approach where we can, uh, where we can evaluate, this is more likely to comply with the reality. So it's, it's the right question. I think like, I would love for there to be like a great deal more research money out there to like study these questions and, and have, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> for the different levels that you have here, are there any examples you can draw on from the private sector that have successfully implemented any of these approaches? Um, the honest answer is not great. There's, uh, I, we haven't done like a big research project on this. I would, I would like to, um, there's some research on when businesses started bringing in data analytics offices into their business operations. So there's a cool big study, it was an observational study on two different models of the way that office, that, that like Fortune 500 companies brought in analytics operations. The first one was create an analytics office, put it, you know, put it somewhere in your bureaucracy and have them, you know, use the company's data and send it up to the C-suite. And it's like, okay, thank you for your analysis. Maybe those our predictions, you know, the, the, the research didn't really get into exactly how those, those offices differed. The other model is embed the analytics office in the C-suite itself and force the organization to start thinking more about how do we gather our data and how do we act upon these analytic findings? And how do we build a decision-making process that is kind of more scientific? Guess what? The original model had zero impact on profits. Often it cost more than it was gaining for them. The other model was like 10% increase in profits. And I think that when we think about our private sector, you know, business space these days, we have tech companies, you know, baseball companies, financial service models that are, that are thinking about highly probabilistic, evidence-based, A-B tested, you know, randomized control trials, decision-making environments. Uh, that and these are the businesses that are succeeding and kind of dominating that you know our, our, our landscape. So um, I don't have like great examples other than that at that highest level for you. I, I think it's something that would be really interesting to research as we think about how to advance this objective. So a lot of what what Dan has said has has got me thinking about Sherman Kent and his early work and a distinct his trying to move like quantitative probabilities into the intelligence community and the pushback he received the distinction he drew between bookies and, and poets. And I think one of the themes of a number of the last few talks is like, how do we do the qualitative and the quantitative at the same time? Or how do we translate the qualitative into the quantitative, but in a way that is digestible to policymakers? How do we mix numbers and narratives, sort of stories and, and statistics? 
Um, I could monologue on this for a while, but in the interest of time and getting to our next participatory exercise, please join me in thanking Dan and the rest of the Lakewood Talk speakers. Thank you, Dan. Okay. So what we are doing now is we are going to have a, an introductory exercise. Um, we're gonna shift a couple of, of seats, but we're gonna try to do three things with this exercise. The first is to ask you to introduce yourselves to the folks at your table so that you get to know each other a little bit better. Then we're gonna ask you to address sort of a series of three questions, which we will put on uh, the screen. There will be a facilitator at your table and we're, we're gonna work through sort of, you know, how forecasting works and doesn't work in your organizations today. And then we'll give you a few minutes of reflection at the end to, to absorb what, what, you've, what you've gathered. And we're gonna ask you to write down like a top takeaway on a sticky note is we're gonna go old tool, we're gonna put it on a sticky note, we're gonna put it on a whiteboard. Um, and, and then we will, we will wrap for lunch, but first, um, let, let us begin. is almost meant to, while complexity is really meant to sort of capture that and that it basically is the complexity that life or learning really induces and I think it's really a key sort of um, an important thing to sort of think about you know it's like basically like a virus is it alive or not but it can learn much like your um, unicellular organisms there this morning I can't remember their exact name um, but they, they do adapt to fitness landscapes and they do evolve and learn when there's immunity pressures, they will change the way that they uh, behave. And so that's uh, an interesting concept for us to keep in mind. And these learning loops, I think, are essential for how we can sort of meld human judgment with um, decision support. And so just to give you a little bit of an idea about who I am and the sort of the work that we've done, we've participated in a variety of these CDC coordinating um, hubs. There's the forecast hub, the scenario modeling hub. We've been doing a lot of influenza forecasting for the years leading up to it. So when COVID hit, we were really kind of uh, already at the ready. And this is like one of the benefits of sort of peacetime preparation. Like there were a, a community that already kind of developed and I'll sort of go through a little bit of the history of some of that. Uh, and to date, like we've been partnering with uh, Justin Crow, who's sitting right over there at the Virginia Department of Health uh, for the last three years plus, um, basically giving regular updates for the first year and a half or so is weekly. It's turned into bi-weekly. They adjust that cadence as things sort of re hopefully remain somewhat calm. There's been like 140 different model updates, lots of different papers and publications, and then just lots of different ad hoc studies that we've done over uh, time, been involved with like, we get a lot of funding through NSF, NIH, uh, some of the work with IARPA, I was just talking with uh, Aaron at Rand, who Jason Matheny is now, um, he was one of the projects I worked on is now the CEO there at Rand. Uh, and so a variety of things. And so before I get into it, I'll tell you upfront what I'm going to try and hopefully you'll take away from this, you know, so if you want to zone out and go into your email, like, the key elements that I've found over these years that have proven useful in decision support is engagement. And I think from the little breakout tables, probably some of the discussions around um, those nice thought provoking questions probably led to that, at least at our table is sort of collectively wrestling with these problems and refining solutions is really important. It sort of helps match up both sort of what you are forecasting, what measures you're looking at and what uh, an individual needs to help inform the decisions that they're going to make. And I'm going to propose like maybe you'd take at least three trips around this sort of learning loop. The first time you sort of get it a little wrong, the second time maybe a little better, and the third time maybe at least you're close enough that is actually useful. And that takes me to the other one, usefulness. Like ultimately that the utility uh, of what you are doing should guide the engagement. And that can be sort of like the sort of the holy grail that you're chasing after. It's really hard to define 
directly what is useful, but um, and like how you should work through this sort of myriad landscape of what is valuable to different individuals and everything, but just chasing after what is useful. Oftentimes it is these stray comments that someone's like, hmm, I wonder why that did that, that if you can go after that and use that energy to chase after it, that you actually will yield something that's more um, useful. And it's not always what the person asked you the first time, but it's really that side comment as you're sort of stopping the conversation that often is what you really should go after. I also wanted to emphasize the importance of community. Um, it's really, really useful to have a shared voice. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about soft data. It's really a bad word. I don't really like it, but harnessing the soft data that is in the world and in the decision maker is really, really uh, important. And then explainability. That's also something I think we need to design studies and analysis that sort of tell a story. I think people are inherently geared towards understanding stories. And so I think that's a, a, a key element to sort of uh, put into this, uh, into your work. And then visualizations, like don't forget the power of a simple plot or an illustration, uh, and often one that actually can lead to sort of a bullet point summary. Like if you can't look at the image and sort of say, what does it mean? Um, then maybe you need to redesign it a little bit. So I wanted to also go through and sort of frame this a little bit by talking about the kinds of decisions that are often faced around infectious diseases. I know we've got a lot of folks from foreign policy in the room and other domains. I, I can't speak to that, but I imagine there's tons and tons of parallels, I imagine. And so the kinds of decisions that are often faced around infectious diseases, um, like planning and preparedness. I think we already had this quote um, thrown out earlier that Planning is meaningless, but planning is everything, you know, and so Eisenhower originally was saying in the battlefield, you know, I found plans to be completely useless, but planning is everything. And I think Joshua was the one who had said that earlier today, and he was talking about how we might be able to embody the plans into sort of more of a computational object. I think that'd be really, really cool. I mean, the, the gist of this, right, is that by thinking through the full plan, you're more prepared to be more robust in responding when, you know, stuff hits the fan and you really got to respond. Uh, and not everything's always going to go exactly to plan, but the fact that you plan makes you more resilient to it. And so they often are looking for, you know, how, how are we going to do this and what are the possibilities of the world? And that's a good way to use models and um, sort of human judgment, uh, supporting an epidemic response. And so when you find yourself in the midst of a crisis, COVID-19 hits, a pandemic flu hits, there's a Ebola outbreak in West Africa, et cetera. Often there are pretty poignant questions that come up. What interventions should we do? When should we do them? Um, how important is balancing you know, a workforce that's dedicated to this, uh, this process versus that process? Like which, which one should we put the, the weight in? Those are the kinds of things that you can use models for uh, and also just evaluating policy decisions. Uh, and there's a variety of examples I can get to a little bit later on about that. And then with Ebola in West Africa, often it was about where are we going to place these treatment facilities? And like, when do we need to act? How bad does it have to get if we had medicine and different uh, activities? When and where do we need to deploy those? And then foresight into the upcoming events. You know, what is it going to look like in a couple of weeks? Uh, how many cases, hospitalizations, deaths? Are we going to be over capacity in our hospital system? Um, does this thing have the mouse? No, okay. Uh, and so uh, are we going to be over capacity in the hospital uh, system? Are we going to exceed uh, what the hospitals can absorb? And then also just sort of like, you know, what path are we on and like how bad would it have been if we had done something differently uh, versus what we're doing now or in the future, if we do something a little bit differently, how bad might it be? Uh, and so that's also the key sort of things that often decision makers are sort of looking for. Um, one quick caveat uh, before we move into the other phase of this is like, what is a decision? You know, there isn't this mythical decision maker with, that's making a singular decision. I've got the sort of the great and powerful Oz. Um, you know, it's like, the, the, I think we've covered this very well, but I mean, the, the key point here to be made is that decisions are collectively shared across individuals and a, and a wide array, a wide array 
of different jurisdictions of authority. And so each of those authorities and individuals have their own context that they bring to the kinds of problems that they're facing and different levers that they can pull and different things that they're trying to optimize. And so really getting into how do we figure out what those are and how can I speak to each one of those different areas um, really is the challenge that comes in when you're trying to support these kinds of decisions. And alas, you aren't just going to a single entity and asking a single question to get a, a, the answer and go away or whatever. And so, you know, decisions makers have their own models and use their own judgments. Um, and really we need to, to be able to support them. Um, we need to take this into account. And so the important elements again, need to provide decision guidance. I don't think this is actually just purely decision-making, but really it's just sort of helping guide and the way that we can fold in um, the methods that we all sort of like and use here <laughs> into guiding the kinds of decisions that are going to be made. And so I start off here with engagement because I really think that that's the most important in many ways. And you'll see this annoying animated slide deck of um, what I've been presenting to Justin sort of <laughs> ad nauseum for three years here, but it basically it's a compilation of analyses and model updates and information um, that sort of goes into everything that is sort of pertinent in this giving week, at least that I'm considering for uh, the model building and the model tuning and the model calibration, uh, as well as then feeding into how we design the scenarios and then using the scenarios to then project into the future. So you can look at what would happen if this changed, what happens if this is the thing that's gonna come into effect, et cetera. And so providing it at different levels of resolution, both temporally and geographically, showing it in movie forms, showing it in static graph forms, it gets a little bit boring, but it, it, the whole point of it is that by doing this and providing all of it, you know, you're giving the full transparency of what this analysis is doing. Um, and that way, you know, it invites the other person into the dance. It takes two to tango here. And so uh, the key part there then is that Justin on his side um, would give briefings internally to his decision-making folks. I was also briefing um, like the secretary of state, uh, of the secretary of health, as well as the secretary of, I guess, what is equivalent to Homeland Security in the Virginia government, as well as education often. And they had different questions that they were very, very interested in. You know, education wanted to know, like if I let the schools go back into session this fall or I give guidance for people to go ahead and do that, how bad might it be? You know, the um, Secretary of Health was really eyeing how much uh, ICU usage there was. Uh, and so that was, really important about like whether the hospitals were gonna be over capacity or not. And so feeding this out, like this sort of analysis and these projections and these models and forecasts, et cetera, BDH was then absorbing those and then writing up their own weekly reports that were publicly released. This was something that generated a whole lot of phone calls from the media, uh, always asking like, oh, we got the most recent weekly update and you say that you know, there's gonna be this huge spike where cases are gonna triple in two weeks. Like, why is that? And again, I, again, like many of the conversations folks have been having and other people have already said that often it's the explanation of why a model is behaving in a particular way, I think is more valuable than the actual like 10,000 cases in the next month or whatever. Um, and that basically it helps you think about what the processes that are driving it um, going forward are. And that's really sort of what can be um, learned and will actually guide a decision more than just being scared that there's gonna be 10,000 cases. And so this sort of, it takes two to tango, this engagement, sort of a regular routine, I think is also really important to this because it helps match up. I think someone said earlier, there's like an impedance mismatch often. And so getting into a regular routine through this kind of engagement where there is both sort of a feedback loop, a learning loop gets instantiated by providing this analysis. Someone reads it, someone finds errors in it, you can fix it the next week and go on through that, um, sort of sets that up. And then you can right size sort of the timing of these, um, the sort of knowledge transfer, as well as sort of the, the questions that you're addressing. Um, again, I sort of alluded to usefulness I think usefulness is sort of a great sort of way of finding 
these unknown needs. I think at our table, I think you were saying, you know, not to quote a particular uh, Secretary of Defense, but there's the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Sometimes figuring out what those known unknowns are takes a lot of conversation. And like I said at the beginning, like that, that comment sort of at the end of a conversation or that question or what might have been sort of initially received as sort of a criticism of the model uh, might be just sort of either a misunderstanding or pointing out an important assumption that maybe is wrong in that model. And by seeking to be useful and improve that, and it's not always easy and it takes this sort of pushing beyond just doing a quote unquote enough um, is really what often can lead um, to finding these sort of known unknowns that you didn't know about, they were unknown to you, but someone that sort of engaged with your material enough and sort of absorbed these predictions enough was able to help lead you toward that unknown. And so I think that's a, a really useful thing. And I, I, one example of that I wanted to bring up was uh, we had originally gotten some data from SafeGraph, this sort of super detailed, anonymized, cell phone data generated mobility information. Um, basically, you know, we're all carrying around our own little homing trackers and they sort of anonymize that enough uh, and then they were able to share it. And that's one of the things that came true during the COVID pandemic as well that I thought was pretty awesome was that a lot of data that had been like really, really, really difficult to try and get or extraordinarily expensive was very rapidly made available freely to academics in support of responding to this crisis. So anyways, the SafeGraph data was available. We've been trying to use it to inform our transmission models. We had a couple of dashboards built where you could sort of play things out like, what if we um, increase the amount of mixing that's going on in gyms or the increase the amount of mixing that's going on in churches? Um, how might we see transmission rates change? And that was, that was useful. Uh, at a certain point in the pandemic, like the, those were sort of moot at some point. And then we got into the phase where we had vaccines and it was showing this mobility um, informed dashboard. Someone's like, you know, if you can figure out how many folks are going to church or whatever, like what I need to know is where those folks are so that I can put my mobile vaccine clinics there. Uh, because there's a lot of people that are vulnerable that aren't gonna go to their doctor to go get the vaccine or wait in a long line. And so we're trying to push out vaccine into the community. And so where could we find that? So again, that was one of these things that hadn't really occurred, but we'd been processing this data week after week. And we're like, okay, this is an alternative use. This could be useful to someone. And so we were able to provide that. And it was a, a guidance that the um, state health department was able to then give to the locals that says, you know, Dollar Tree on Thursday afternoon is pretty busy near you. You might want to consider putting up your um, clinic in the parking lot there. Um, community. Community, I think, is really, really important. And right here, I've got just sort of a slight evolution of what I perceive, at least, as sort of the infectious disease forecasting slash modeling um, evolution. Uh, a long time ago, there was this NIH project called MIDAS. It still goes on, but it, originally it was a cooperative agreement. Um, a lot of the folks in the community um, sort of uh, joined this um, cooperative agreement over the years. Um, is basically there is an effort to do multi-model fusion uh, to inform sort of pandemic preparedness for what at the time was perceived as pandemic influenza. Um, and basically we tried to model targeted layer containment was the cutesy name. And again, the champion here was someone from the federal government, um, Richard Hatchett, and engaged with three different modeling groups uh, it was a really interesting sort of thing. And we really tried to come up with six scenarios that we would all put into our models. All of our models were very different. Whose model was more right than the others was a favorite topic of conversation where some people could get quite animated about uh, at some of those meetings. But nonetheless, we cooperated together and we did make this sort of final thing. And it did show things like, if you can shut the schools down early, you can really set things, like stop things. Not that... Um, People necessarily doubted that, but it was able to sort of quantify it. And then liberal leave policies for uh, work. And all of these are things that we saw happen in COVID. I remember many meetings presenting this to folks where they just refused to believe that that could ever even happen. Uh, They're like, they'll never shut down the schools. You know, school boards house the authority to do that. There's no way to give like a, 
an official decree for that, but it was really interesting there in March uh, of 2020 to see it sort of happen pretty, pretty rapidly. That evolved into seasonal influenza forecasting challenge. Uh, Matt Biggerstaff and multiple others at CDC sort of organized this regular routine, started off in 2013, uh, has continued to this day. Uh, I think they just Blessedly, I think today is the final day actually where we have to submit a forecast, right, Trini? So, uh, so this season has come to a close um, with the, the flu forecasting. Um, so that's been going on for a long time. And that was great because that built up even more of a community and it brought in others. So there's a lot of physicists and others that were trying out new techniques. And that one really was about like, if you had a really cool data source, you could do a much better job. And that was an interesting Thing. That was in the era where like harnessing Twitter and everything was actually really useful for predicting the, the flu. And then the Ebola outbreak happened in 2014. This sort of even further gelled the community like sort of a really big sort of crisis that for a while seemed uh, a, a little bit scary uh, for folks. And again, we had models as a key tool for the outbreak response. And there was a lot more sort of questions coming in from the federal government about like, what should we do? What kinds of actions uh, make the most sense? And then obviously the COVID-19 pandemic response is just a huge, huge effort that many of us in this room spent a whole lot of, uh, of time being involved in. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit more detail. But I think the community that formed here and having this shared voice and these sort of cooperative hubs that allow a transparent way for people to contribute to sort of a forecast um, that was extremely useful. Uh, and I think the decision makers could sort of appreciate that. And there is wisdom in the crowds. We've been able to uh, multiple, many, many times, everyone already here already knows this, but many, many times sort of show that the ensembles do better than individual models uh, in these situations. And research, now that we've got this whole huge base of these, we can even do better research to make the ensembles even better uh, than some of the simple approaches that we've originally taken. And then another great example of this, I think, is a scenario modeling hub, which is something we've been participating in. Um, I think for all of the rounds that they've conducted, we're currently trying to submit the 17th round. And they've been involved in many of the sort of decisions that are at least we designed, implemented, and executed studies to inform federal decisions. And again, this was CDC coordinated and questions asked from like White House task force kinds of things about NBI decisions after we got this initial vaccine. Is it going to be enough? Do we need to keep wearing masks after we get the this sort of a, initial dosage down? Then the expansion of the vaccine eligibility to the five to 11 year olds. I think I heard one table talking about how, how relieving it was when you finally got your kids those shots. That was, that, that, that was really helpful for, for my, my mental <laughs> state. Um, the impact of the Delta wave, um, that was another one of these rounds. It was done in July uh, and then just most recently in September. And then we updated this again a little bit later on, but the role of a bivalent dose, if we get that bivalent dose out a little bit earlier, how much of an impact is it? Are we going to be worried about a surge that might happen in the spring if we do it too early? Uh, we played that out. And I know there's myriad factors that went into the decision, but we do know that they did indeed look at some of these modeling results from our group and like five or six other groups are all ensembled together um, to help make those decisions. So again, this sort of community that came up lends a little bit of extra credence and the value of just sort of the cross fertilization of ideas, um, sort of the self-criticism of each other and um, sort of the cross fertilization of both students and or data sources, et cetera, was extremely valuable. And I've seen this community get really quite strong at this point. And so it's um, been pretty pretty nice. And so I think it's really important um, in guiding decisions to be able to have the sort of shared voice. Um, soft data, the crucial ingredient for decisions. Um, I guess this like, uh, this, one, this one's a little tricky. Like without this so-called soft data, and we were talking about this again at my table a little bit, you know, decisions wouldn't require support necessarily and could become the domain of automation. So again, what I mean by this soft data is sort of things that aren't very easy to quantify, things that are a little bit, I think um, earlier, and again, I'm sorry, I can't remember, but the person from FP, 
two one was saying like how in uh where are you there you are sorry what's your name again don dan 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 i thought it was great where it's basically deliberately like rejected like this is like something in your brain this is something that's in your heart and your gut like we don't want numbers this is an art like that really is really important and you know if it really was as simple as like i want the temperature to be 72 degrees like without fail then like a thermostat can do the job and like you don't need you don't need to support the decision it's just it's going to be 72 the thing gets hot the thing gets cold that's it uh and so like you don't want to interest yourself unless there is some of that soft data and so i think it's really important for the forecasting outcomes to be guided towards where that sort of softness starts <laughs> to be able to provide guidance at those levels and sort of allow that sort of heart and brain to sort of do the job that it's supposed to do. Uh, and so I think that's really important. And this matching of the models and the forecasts with the kinds of decisions that are under consideration is really, really a tricky part. And so like making space and acknowledging that there's a soft data, not that everything is in the model, uh, I think is an important element here. And I think one thing that's interesting is that you can build in the ability to absorb some of this soft data as well into your models and guide the way that you formulate some of the scenarios to be really useful. Um, and this is something that Jason, who just uh, came in, uh, participated in as well as this Ebola forecasting challenge, uh, was it was a challenge across a lot of different teams to evaluate how they could absorb this kind of soft data. There's four different scenarios that were played out. They had different trajectories of the epidemic and they had different levels of information that was shared with the challenged teams. And so you get one report and it was like complete information. Like there's absolutely going to be this many people that can be isolated in this county on this in the on these days. And then there was one like the scenario four, which was the one that we did really not so great on. Um, which was you had very poor information. You had um, the epidemic didn't look like any epidemic we'd really ever seen, et cetera, uh, et cetera. And it did demonstrate that this soft information about future plans. So if you just got a big thing, like there may be some variety of uh, isolating uh, tents available in these counties over the next month or whatever, like you, if you had a model that was structured such that you could incorporate that, we were able to see that those models were able to do a little bit more um, in performance wise. And so again, capturing to some degree this opt information, having that sort of decision making, leave it off and then have the models then be able to incorporate them in uh, to complete the loop um, is very useful. And then uh, an example here about explainability. And so, Narratives really do drive understanding. In our group, we try and do models that are very detailed and sort of have the mechanisms for things to happen. And so a little cartoon in the top uh, right there is about the zoonotic emergence of Ebola and like ways that that can happen. And people have done a lot, of, a lot more sophisticated work than we've done on this about where the niches for Ebola might be where different um, uh, ecosystems of animals and uh, cultural practices overlap sufficiently to allow the zoonotic to happen, the zoonotic transmission to happen more often. Uh, and so I think it's an interesting part here that, you know, we've got human judgment folks in the room and computational modelers in the room and that basically human judgment really often focuses on these processes and these sort of causal paths. Uh, machine learning style approaches have a lot of promise, but they often reverse the sort of causation. And sometimes that doesn't matter so much, but sometimes it can. Uh, and so I think, a really good way to meld these things is by incorporating scenarios and computational models that are informed by human judgment and or allow us to evaluate different hypotheses about what is going on. And so a, a, an example of this is from the Ebola thing. We had this uh, learning from LOFOs, the way I sort of had termed this just because I like alliteration. But in essence, in the Ebola epidemic, as we were watching it unfold in Liberia, there is a county LOFO where it sort of really sort of started off um, early on, that's the red line on the, on the left here. And we so, sort of noticed that after a while, there'd been like this grassroots efforts, very active public uh, health director in there and it educated the public about reducing transmission. And it sort of bent over a little bit earlier. Uh, and so we we're like, you know, ultimately this is probably gonna play out in other geographic areas of Liberia. And so as we were trying to better inform our model about 
the course of the disease in Liberia. Overall, we wanted to learn from LOFA. And so we fit this model to LOFA, we translated it, we were able to tell this sort of story, like if you know they do sort of learn from LOFA and they see what's going on there and that does sort of play out in um, Liberia as a whole, uh, we would expect to see what's on the far right. So if we apply it to there and that turned out to be re re relatively uh, predictive of what did end up happening. Uh, and another thing I think uh, that is another example in the COVID-19 space is again, of uh, these regular updates and the importance of using these models or these judgments even, um, these scenarios as sensors to learn about what is happening and why. And so on the right here, you'll see adaptive versus adaptive variant X. And then the black line is the ground truth observations of Virginia Daily Hospital admissions. Uh, and then the dash line is sort of the projection timeline. Um, and so basically you can see the two models being fit. And then basically one is playing out if there is an emerging variant. And this was something I think we did, when was that, November, I guess, of last year. Uh, if like we see XBB15 emerging and has like 30% immune escape, I think was what that scenario had built into it, you would see the trajectory follow the green line. Uh, otherwise, if things just sort of continue on and there is no variant that sort of takes hold and doesn't have any major immune escape, you'd see something like the blue line. And so after a couple more weeks of observation, you start seeing your track in the green line. So this is like a sensor that like, hey, there may be the one possible explanation is that there is this uh, variant out there, et cetera. Uh, and then also on the left side, just sort of about different levels of when um, sort of the lockdown in the very beginning of the pandemic was sort of eased a little bit. And we did end up tracking along that sort of June 10th. And that was roughly about when uh, people basically got too um, frisky to stay in their homes for much longer. Um, and then closing up, I guess I wanted to go through visualization. I think this is a really, really vital tool for communication. I really tried hard, Guy, to find like the perfect, like this is an ugly picture and made people think something wrong. And this is a pretty picture that made people think right, but I couldn't really come up with it. But the examples I have here, I mean, I think communication is just as important, if not more important than the analysis itself. If you can't convey what the analysis is saying in a very meaningful way, then it, it's, it's just not as, uh, it's just not very valuable. Uh, and so the example here on the top, you know, is sort of like the classic sort of like you can fit any sort of mass of dots with a bunch of different models and they'll, they all kind of look okay. I stole this from an XKCD comic that I'll show at the end. Um, but you can just sort of see like, yeah, linear looks all right. Well, quadratic, maybe better, well, logarithmic, maybe, yeah, you know. Uh, and then the bottom one is just like this sort of movie. And again, this idea of like animations can be really, really um, powerful. Uh, and I thought that I heard the nice anecdote from Aaron over at my table about, you know, for picture, like, pic like uh, pictures worth a thousand words, but like a bullet points worth a thousand pictures. And like, you don't want to have a thousand pictures you want to be able to make a single animation, maybe, that can lead to a bullet point. Um, and it's very easy to be able to generate a ton of plots, but synthesizing all of those in your brain can be a little hard. And so finding the right way to sort of mesh them together uh, can be really important. And so another example of this is from some of the initial emergence from China things. These are both basically the same data being shown here on the, on the left side. Um, but in two different ways, sort of like, here's the emergence out of China and here's when you might uh, see all these different countries if you could read the um, words embedded in those little teeny dots. Uh, but then you can sort of also fit a linear line and sort of look at it, label them out a little bit better and then you get a better idea about what day you might expect the, the, uh, the virus to arrive in those countries given the existing um, travel volumes and how far away um, they are. And then here on the right side is sort of a couple of different ways that you can show forecasts over time. With Metaculus, it's always interesting in that uh, the way that these, these um, contests are run and often the forecasts that we make with computational models is like there's a time that you make the forecast and then there's a bounds and you can update it, but then you're still doing that out into the future from what you've currently been observing. And so this movie here in the bottom right is one that Shrini nicely put together where basically you see the band of uncertainty of a forecast into the future and you're watching this blue line slowly track towards it and see if it can 
get through the hoop of what the metaculous forecasters called uh, off into the future. When they go gray is when that, that thing closed down or no longer accepted any more updates. Uh, and you can see that it did pretty well on this particular hospital forecast. And so again, what I just told you is like the importance of engagement, seeking usefulness, community as a shared voice, making sure you make space for the soft data, uh, explainability, and um, don't forget the power of a, a simple plot or illustration. Um, and so again, just to close with a final thought of like, how do we meld human judgment and models? I think that we have this tremendous opportunity before us. I mean, obviously that's why we're probably all here in this room. Um, but I think we really are at an interesting point where the role of modeling is greatly elevated uh, and its support during this pandemic. And so the appetite is there. And we're also in a society now where we have, you know, we all have these, like there's tons of models running on these things every moment, right? Uh, we're familiar with it and we're used to sort of poking it a little bit. Like, well, what if I started my route from over here instead of over there? Oh, look, the traffic's better somehow. Like we're used to sort of thinking the way that these models work. And so computational modeling has more data and increasing array of um, powerful methods available to it. And human judgment and stores of this sort of soft data are easier and easier to harness through like platforms like Metaculus, but also just through uh, the sort of appetite <laughs> that uh, humans have for these kinds of models. And so hopefully we can get into the best of both worlds where we can integrate both of these into these uh, learning loops. And so I'll stop there. I think I, think I did all right on time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone, please join me in thanking Brian Lewis. Thank you, Brian. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. But, uh, we are going to move on to our next uh, panel discussion, but I'm sure many of you have questions for Brian. I, I have questions, including the, about the, the favorite, best. Right? <laughs> the, my favorite. Yeah, we can maybe uh, have a poll uh, later. Um, but good news is we have time for questions during coffee and, sure. and, and, and things Sorry like that. Sorry to run a little bit late. No, 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 no not, not at all. Not at all. Fascinating, fascinating talk. I want to introduce our panel though, um, which is going to be moderated by Erica Goldman of the Federation of American Scientists. We're gonna talk about communicating with decision makers. And one of the things that occurs to me when we talk about communicating with decision makers is that it, it sounds like a little unidirectional. And, and one thing that, that we were talking about in reference to, to a point that Rob made earlier is that communication really begins with problem definition. Um, and, and that's sort of the point maybe at which we should begin engagement, because if we're not asking, if we're not either A, identifying the, the right problem or B, talking about the right problem, we're not, we're not going to get to the right answer, just sort of definitionally speaking. We're certainly not going to provide the most useful policymaking input that we can. So um, with, with that, I will turn things over to Erica. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to invite the panel to come out, Salwa, and I think Tame went to the bathroom, Rita. Um, so thanks. I think Brian's talk teed this up so well and has touched on many of the elements of communication already. Um, just by way of brief introduction, um, Peter introduced me. I'm Erica from the Federation of American Scientists, and we've been thrilled to collaborate with Metaculus on this convening. And just to give you a sense of kind of who we are and, and kind of what, what we think about in terms of um, engagement in this space, so for those of you who are familiar with FAS, we've been around since 1945, have gotten our start in national and nuclear security, but in the past few years have really broadened our scope um, quite a bit, work on climate and the environment, wildfire, uh, meta science. Uh, you've heard a little bit about the breadth of our work, but what unifies kind of the way in which we approach problems is this idea of policy entrepreneurship. So we believe that great ideas can come from everywhere and that there's a diversity of energy in the broader science and technology community, but oftentimes those ideas need help making it into the policy making ecosystem. So we, we do a lot of work on crowdsourced policy development, working with um, folks to develop their ideas into actionable policy memos. We also run um, a fellowship program where we're working with government agencies for them to, to help them identify opportunities where, but for this individual in this role, we'd be able to make uh, progress in a particular domain. And we work closely with um, government agencies as partners to think about um, kind of opportunities for 
ways in which science and technology can ha and bringing it in in an actionable way can make their their lives easier. And so we've been working um, with Metaculus and thinking about forecasting as a potential tool of policy entrepreneurship. And you've heard kind of a lot about this today in terms of the ways in which you know forecasting clearly has a lot of decision relevance, but how we bring that that decision relevance into the hands of policy maker makers in ways that can be made easier. Uh, there's a lot of, of nuance and sophistication on, uh, to that. And so that is part of what our panel is going to, to talk about today. And I think we've, we've teed up both this idea of kind of policymaker uptake and communication really well. Um, so I am thrilled to introduce our panel, Marita, Sala, and Pema. Um, Marita, uh, you are from the Institute of Disease Modeling in Seattle, and Sala, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, the information energy information administration in the Department of Energy, um, and Pame, uh, MIT, and EPOC, right? Um, so maybe we could just kick off by uh, hearing a little bit about your work and your worlds and what, um, what areas you are doing forecasting in and what audiences you are being asked to communicate about the outcomes of those forecasts to, and um, maybe beginning with, with Maria. Yeah. Um, is it uh, now? Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. I've already learned so much today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, with the Institute for Disease Modeling, which is an embedded research institute in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So as said in the name, we do a lot of infectious disease modeling, uh, although a lot of my work lately is on some women's health and family planning uh, modeling topics. Relevant to today, I'll probably mostly be talking about our COVID modeling experiences. So the last talk seemed very familiar. I think we made almost the exact same figures for Washington State. So good to see we're all doing similar things. Um, and in terms of forecasting, I actually wouldn't say that we really do forecasting. We do a lot of modeling, but we almost never do models to try to predict exactly the number of cases or deaths that are gonna happen, partly because we'd be very bad at it. Um, but we do create a lot of predictions and uh, confidence in predictions about the impact of different interventions or policy choices or scenarios that might happen in infectious disease scenarios. Um, and policymakers depend on the topic for COVID. We worked a lot with the governor and mayor and local public health departments. Aside from that, we of course talk to Bill and Melinda Gates a lot. We also work with ministries of health, uh, multilaterals, other uh, implementation partners in country and academics, I suppose as well. And Pass it off. Hi, everyone. Hello. Oh, keep it pressed. Hello. Yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, it oh. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. This one works. Uh, hi, everyone. Swale Siddiqui. I'm with the Energy Information Administration of the Department of Energy. Um, we're the primary federal government agency that produces all the energy data forecasts, as well as project long term projections um, for the energy system. So if you ever find any federal based energy data, it very likely came from us. If you look at any sort of energy forecast over the long run for the United States, it's either using our data or sometimes even based on our projections or forecasts that we make. And so uh, part of the things, like I said, so I, I work on the modeling side in handling our forecasts, but also long-term projections of the energy system. So thinking about the production, consumption, prices, trade of different energy commodities, um, how different technologies will play out under current policies. One thing I will say though, is that since we're part of the Department of Energy, uh, one of our major roles is to communicate to policymakers. So often we get requests from policymakers. We provide information that helps design policy. And a lot of times, you know, that sort of back and forth engagement is just second nature to us. And that's that's primarily one of the goals of what we do. Uh, that also means that even though we're part of the Department of Energy, that we have to, when one of the main tenants at the EIA is that we have to remain policy neutral, 
which means that we have to be very careful when we're making our projections or forecasts. So we, we don't actually go and design new policies and we can't make any projections that are even looking like we're designing new policies because that's not our goal. Like our goal isn't making the policy, it's just informing the policy. And so often um, when we make projections and forecasts, you know, a lot of people are like, well, are you really predicting this? And what we like to say is, no, this, this long-term projection is not a forecast because we know there will be new policies based on what we just put out. And so this will likely not happen. However, this should be used as a tool to answer what if type questions that you do have nowadays for policies. Um, one of the other thing, one of some of our other customers also are private companies, academia, other forecasters. And so we have to often, you know, sort of produce a variety of products and a variety of analysis that really helps with, um, with, with all types of things. And so often times, you know, people will say, well, why did you produce this? And it's, well, that's not for you. That's for this other stakeholder that, uh, that it's really important for. Um, but yeah, so we, so I'm happy to talk a little bit about our experience, you know, because we are sort of embedded in the federal government, it, it makes sort of our life a little bit easier <laughs> engaging with policy and policymakers. Uh, and, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about how the pitfalls and advantages and disadvantages of that as well. Hey, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Very excited. Um, I love the energy and interest in forecasting. There's a sense in which there's a lot more attention given to forecasting. So I'm excited to talk about how we communicate these forecasts in a wide range of disciplines, including those that traditionally don't see quantitative forecasts very often. So my name is Tamai. I work at the Computer Science and AI Lab at MIT. There I focus on the future of computing. I have a background in computer science and economics. I think a lot about computing technologies. I've been working with the NSF and folks um, with the um, CHIPS Act on trying to design investment policies that and portfolios that you know, make good use of CMOS and post-CMOS technologies. I also think about the implications of deployment of AI on economics, on automation, productivity, growth. At Epoch, which is an organization that I co-founded, I think a lot about the future of AI and we build data sets that help track and fact find what's going on in AI and model and simulate what the future might hold in store. Thanks everybody. So I would love to hear a little bit more about um, specific examples of how you've tailored the communicate your communications to a particular audience. Um, and maybe if you have a specific example that you're especially proud of to share. Um, Whoever wants to begin. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, Salwa, I'll call on you. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you say uh, you want to go first. So. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll give an example actually that came out in, so every year we put out an annual energy outlook um, that provides an outlook for the United States of what will happen to the energy system. And one of the more important things this year um, was looking at uncertainty and looking at how uncertainty evolves in our forecasts and in, in our projections, even I'm making that mistake now. And so one of the, one of the really relevant topics this year under consideration, which really every year was um, the climate goals the United States has set out for itself. Now, again, we're, we're not a policy office, right? So we, we don't design policy, we just evaluate it. And one of, the, one of the sort of feedback that we've always gotten on our projections is that we tend to underestimate progress when it comes to carbon emission reduction. Of course, that makes sense because we can't design the future policy that takes place. So the projections we make today don't take into account the future policy that might come in. And so one of the questions that we did get from stakeholders um, and primarily people who do study policy in the government was, well, is there any way you can talk about if you could incorporate that uncertainty in your projection, what might that look like? Like, could you say like, okay, if today we're projecting carbon emissions are going to be a certain amount and in the future, um, can you talk about like, if policies did come into play, how that would work? And so that, that was a very tricky situation for us because it was a request, well, not a request, but something we were hearing from stakeholders. At the same time, we don't wanna be saying that, okay, we designed a policy and now it's gonna be this high or this low. And so one of the things we did was, this was something in the academic literature, we looked at, 
our past projection um, errors, and I mean error in a mathematical sense, so whenever our projections were off from the actual value of carbon emissions, and said this was how we were estimating differences in the past. We used those to generate, you know, going forward that if we make the same type of errors, now we're making an assumption, we're making an assumption that our model hasn't really improved. We're also making an assumption that the world sort of has errors as it did in the past. But we're able to use those to actually make a cone of uncertainty that kind of helps show that like, even though we're projecting carbon emissions to a particular amount, there's an uncertainty based on how we've been, and I don't want to say wrong, how we've been different in the past um, to, uh, to show you that how wide this can go. I think I think one of the advantages of this was one, I mean, it's a relatively simple way to, to project the uncertainty, but also it's a very introspective way. And in many ways, like I think as the federal government, we have the luxury to do that, right? Like we're not, we're not competing for funding. We're not competing for anything else like that. We can say like, hey, we're, this is the type of projections we made. These were the errors that were there. And so we were able to include that as part of it. And I think one of the things that helped do was you know, move people away from this idea that like the federal government is expecting an X percent of emissions reductions um, and able to say like, okay, EIA says that there can be a wide variety of emissions reduction. It all depends on the new policies that come out. And I think that really helped um, because it came with that introspection and that idea. Other examples, you can you share an example of something you're particularly per proud about, proud of, or a counter example of something that you tried and really didn't work and caused you to rethink your communication? So I don't often find myself tailoring forecasts or projections too much. Communication, I, not the projection itself. Or yeah. Or, yeah. Um, and I guess the reason for this, well, one way to look at it is to suppose that there's some trade-off between precision and like clarity or something where like you could have it, have a project like some prediction or forecast and you can make this a bunch clearer and more accessible, but this somehow comes at the cost of like accurately conveying the model that you've built. But often I don't find this is kind of the reason that your projections aren't clear. Like usually when you look at a, you know, some chart, some plot that communicates some models and predict predictions, um, the reason those models aren't, those, those plots aren't very clear is not because people try to kind of make it as simple as possible, but for other reasons that like they didn't, you know, iterate sufficiently many times, there aren't like clear design standards and so on. And so there's actually little tailoring that I currently do. Like I try um, to produce work such that the kind of key results can be communicated to like a very wide range of audience. Um, now there might be some trade-offs pretty basically when deciding to communicate uncertainty like when you um, communicate confidence intervals and so on, this can sometimes get a little tricky, but if you communicate uncertainty at all, I find that like there's just, you know, not a very strong trade-off. You just try to get a clearer communication that, that is still very kind of accurate to the model that you're trying to um, convey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely, oh, maybe it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely agree with you on the figure point, like the iteration of making the figure, we definitely go through almost every time and it always feels like such a slow process, but so important to get to the right figure that you want to use. But beyond that, I think that I do tailor a lot, like we'll have the one slide version that's like just the figure and like three bullet points. And then we have the 10 slide version that's like, okay, you have 15 minutes, you can go through. And then we have like the hour presentation version. And then we have the like academic manuscript version. So they probably all have that key figure, but it's like how much other detail that audience wants to see or would be interested to see. And that we've definitely had fails with that too. Like there's sometimes you bring the 10 slide version and you get stuck on the first slide for the whole time. So it's kind of like learning that audience every time how much they want to see. So we benefit when we have an ongoing relationship that we know like, okay, this guy wants to see two slides. We know what he wants to see on the two slides. When it's someone new, that's harder to tell. So picking up on that, because Marita, you shared a little bit about the work you did when during COVID and briefing the mayor and stuff. What did, what, um, how did you learn your audience? 
what did you do from kind of, and I would love to hear everyone answer this as well as, you know, I'm sure you've, you've all had experiences with multiple iterations of like, okay, well, that kind of worked, but, but maybe I could try something different. What, can you share a little bit about your process of you know, either? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I'll start out with that. We had the benefit of having policymakers who were like really excited to see the data and modeling, which definitely made it a lot easier for us because like we started off on a really trusting relationship. So we didn't have to build up as much of that at the beginning. Um, and I think a lot of it was, like I said, we weren't trying to produce specific forecast numbers. I picture it more of like, we, the goal is not for me to tell you that like, there's going to be this number of COVID cases on this day. The goal is to facilitate a conversation. Like the goal is for you to understand what we can and can't tell from the data that we have now. And for you to have what you need to be able to make decisions. And of course, the modeling is one small part of what goes into some policymakers' decision. So I think a lot of it was like in those first few conversations, listening to what they were asking and starting to understand what they really want to know from the modeling, which is not necessarily the same things that we think are important from the modeling. So the back and forth, I think was really important. So being able to kind of iterate based on what you yeah. hear and not assume that because you're kind of there to talk about the, the science and the modeling and the process that that's necessarily where they're going to want to right. get your information. Yeah. yeah. Other, thoughts? Other thoughts on that? Yeah, that seems, seems right to me. So I, I recently did some work for the CHIPS Act where we did a bunch of work on trying to design these optimal portfolios that maximize the chance of building new semiconductor technologies that would you know, advance computing in the US. And then we chatted with some of the folks at the NSF and other people behind the decisions here. And I was like super surprised by the extent to which they were just focused on trying to beat China rather than like advancing the US um, technology interests on like trying to make sure that the US gets first to various milestones rather than just maximizing the expected kind of value that you might imagine portfolio design is usually trying to optimize for, right? And so um, it's often surprising the, um, the kind of disconnect that I might see between what I would initially want to kind of optimize for and what government or might be interested in. Uh, I just want to quickly highlight something you pointed out earlier in one of our earlier talks. You had a question of the model was open source. And I often find that is a really good way to try and gain trust and really gain, like, you know, help people understand, like, make this a two way street. Because often modelers walk in the room and we're already opaque because we're modelers um, automatically. And if, if the model is already open and it's open source and you put that out there, even if it's not completely accessible, I think that goes a long way in gaining that trust and getting that communication going. So I thought it was a good point. So I wanna just pick up on the theme of trust for a second, especially you know, in a field, emerging field like AI in a situation where you know, the world is afraid and doesn't understand the impacts of COVID. Um, the, the fact that we're in a world where disinformation and public trust of science is at an all-time low. Um, can you speak a little bit more kind of about how, how you as individuals or how your organizations work to, to build trust in both models um, and forecasting as a process, but also in terms of the, the outcomes of what you're hoping people will take from, from what you're doing? Um, whoever wants to start. Um, yeah, I, th I agree open source is, a big part of that, our models are all open source for that reason, even if like they're in Python and not everyone can just go and read a, a bunch of lines of Python, at least they know that they could if they figured out how to read it. <clears throat> um, and I think beyond that, a lot of it for us was being really transparent about what we didn't know and what the models couldn't tell us. And we always really erred on the side of caveating everything that our model said and emphasizing the limitations and emphasizing the uncertainty. And it means that our models were used less than some other COVID models. Like we were not the New York Times headline models. 
and we consciously made that choice that in order to to do that in order to have that kind of impact we would have to make really blanket statements that we didn't feel comfortable making and it's a real trade off because you want to be able to have like someone has to be that model someone has to make that impact um but i do think that the trade off for us was that we had a smaller impact like a you know more local level impact but we had that really trusting relationship with the policymakers um because they understood what the limitations of what we could tell them are and they took the information that we gave them and put it in the context of everything else that they knew yeah that seems right to me so um yeah in terms of building as much trust as possible like there's no simple substitute for just like doing really great rigorous work that you know is at the frontier of what one could do at one point in time and communicating the uncertainty very carefully um like you know where necessary provide you know confidence intervals and communicating like by caveating the appropriate like you know phrases to make sure that the reader understands what the status of your confidence is and so on um the other things are just you know the usual academic things of making sure that you engage with all the prior work you kind of understand the methodology and signal that you understand the kind of methodological kind of issues and so on and like have novel things to say about that um make sure that like you collaborate and you get feedback from some of the best people who know about this so i often at you know the organization that i work at we have like this external um we have a we have a list of like external experts who we consult on these questions who are like the top experts on that topic and we try to get calls with them to to make sure that everything is like up to what they expect this to be and then just do this very consistently over a long time and and that's you know that's basically the way i imagine building trust i i like find the um point about like making sure that you present this in a way that's commensurate with your level of confidence really important um like there's often a interest in like trying to polish your work beyond the kind of you know the the kind of level of confidence that you have so that it looks much more impressive than it actually is and like there's this um yeah it's like important to you know push back from that and just be more measured about this so there's an aspect of um kind of embedded over a long time frame that i think build builds trust i think in a situation like 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 covid you know we you didn't have the luxury of of sort of building trust over a long time how and then sala i'm interested in you know your model where you're embedded within the within the federal government so you have the benefit of kind of being the go-to resource over a long period of time can you um comment a little bit about kind of what you've observed about the process of trust building and how important it is in terms of building um you know seeing decision makers want to use the outcomes of modeling and the fact that trust takes takes a long time to build and can be easily disrupted um so it's interesting like I was thinking has everyone read escape from modeland or no anyone heard of this book oh it just came out in the summer it's very interesting so the uh, the author like takes a real target at models and is like we got to get away from all these models and they're wrong and she and she knows about these models and she's really sort of saying that like both modelers and the people who use the models are guilty of this and we've like become over dependent on these models and we need to move away um she provides some really good advice on how models can build a certain like humility i think we've been talking about that caveating um but there's some other things she talks about where she says you know modelers should realize that different model results are good like it's not a bad thing if your model gives something that is unexpected or different or things like that and and i feel like that's one main avenue of trust that that becomes difficult i mean one of the advantages of being inside the federal government i mean okay i'm going to put this on a spectrum my opinion not the federal government's opinion um if you think about building trust right like there's the part of trust where someone's a complete stranger and then there's the trust which is someone's a family member um where like the family member can like do something wrong every day but they're your family and so you're like i'm not i'm going to stick with them no matter what um and that's i would say we're kind of there right now right like so we get criticisms from our family members we're like 
what are you doing? What is this? Blah, blah, blah. But okay, fine. You're part of the family. So we, we have to trust you. Um, and so I think that's, that's an advantage for us in, in that way. But I think one of the important things for us is to repay it by reminding everyone of the boundaries, right? Like as you would do in relationships, it's like, yes, you know, this is what our models can do. And we really know that you want, you really want us to produce this or, you know, analyze this stuff, but reminding them again and again, that this is not what a model is supposed to do, like being very humble in the face of it. And, you know, sometimes honestly, like tell us and telling policymakers that you're the democratically elected people, right? Like the models aren't supposed to make your decisions. Like this, the people have sent you to make the decisions. Like we're here just to inform. Um, and so I think that is also one way that we found that at least like I found personally that, you know, if you draw those boundaries about like, we're not going to do this because that's not something that we can do. I often find that leads to more trust uh, oftentimes, especially in, in the position we're in. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I really like thinking of it as humility. Like that's a great way to and like to encompass a lot of the interactions and like going into it with the idea that I'm here to provide my one piece of information. You have to take that information and, you know, make the decisions and understanding the amount of influence that you can and can't have, I think helps that interaction, like know, know what you're going to get, know what each side is going to get out of that interaction. Yeah. I like that. All right. I'm going to ask one more question and then I want to open it up to everyone else to ask you guys questions. So we've touched on this a little bit already, uh, but both complexity and uncertainty are things that, you know, that you deal with communicating all the time. I think there's, there's differences, I'm sure, in your audience about, you know, in terms of comfort with even the concept of uncertainty, certainly with degree of complexity. Can you talk a little bit about how through communication you, you address both of these? And uh, Maidi, you want to start? Um, I'll start by saying we don't do a good job at it. You know, I mean, I think, but but I think that's it, you know a lot of the energy system is becoming more and, and you know and it's not meaning that we don't try or it's not not a good job but like I think we can always do better and I think it's because at least in the energy sphere now it's becoming something that everyone is interested in and so there's some really good resources we make available in terms of the data and the visualizations and and things like that but the the overall like the, the complexity in the energy system is, is is so much that even people who aren't in those individual spheres sometimes can't understand it. Um, one of the things we do is we always try and sort of display like the whole wealth of information, right? So if you go on EIA's website, you won't just find the two or three graphics, you'll find all the data tables, all the scenarios, everything there, right? And, and in some ways, like, the reason I said we don't do a good job is because like we make everything available but then it's up to the user or the customer to like get what they want. And often a lot of people don't know that. So I think we can, we're, we're trying to work towards a way of doing that better, creating better visualizations. And one of the things we did, for example, was just create a New England dashboard. And the reason we did that was we realized that winter fuel prices became very, very important for that particular area, right? And so the question could become, well, why don't you create a dashboard for everyone? But but that one we knew was going to be relevant, especially as this particular winter came around. And it was very, very useful for those people to kind of address the complexity and the uncertainty of just the energy system in New England. Um, and so I, I would say that was one example where we we tried to target it really well, but I think we can do so much better and, and, we're, and we're trying our best to as well. Yeah, so I definitely like the idea of making everything available and open source and getting a sense or like providing a good sense to the audience of like, this is the model. These are its complexities. These are its shortcomings. This is like the predictions it generates. These are sensitivity analyses and robustness to various changes in modeling. Um, so I've since recently become really keen on making these like interactive models available online as like, kind of supplementary material to say a paper where you have a website where you can play around with the model and like have sliders and, and, and see what the predictions are conditional in different settings. And um, I've gotten like really good responses from doing this type of thing. And 
Um, so I try to do this now with like every major piece of work where I like create an associated kind of interactive model online, um, which like is a bit of a challenge, making sure that you can provide this in a way that's intuitive and so on. Um, so one thing that we have found very useful is just doing a lot of interviews and like showing people the figure, showing people the model and just sitting down with them and asking like, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? What, what do you make of this? And we find that it's often just ridiculously easy for people to misunderstand things. And, um, and so you just have to do this over and over again until you converge where like there aren't many people who misunderstand it and then it seems ready to like be published. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this seems like a good way of like making sure you give the complexity and uncertainty in like a way that's understandable and like not liable to people misapprehending it. Yeah, um, agree with both of you. We're not great at it and there are good examples of groups that are innovating to do better at visualizing uncertainty. I think some things we're getting better at, like pretty much everyone puts confidence bounds around their line projections now. We still do a lot of things like maps that you really can't show uncertainty with, so that's a limitation. Um, but I'll, I, I've been in a few of these conversations talking about how do we show uncertainty and what kind of figures can we use, which is of course important. But I think I would, I kind of want to try to reframe this conversation that I think a lot of times the uncertainty is the result. Like that's the thing that you want to talk about. Like it's not about we have this one number and we're not sure about where it is. It's about we don't know if we're currently in the low transmission setting or the high transmission setting. That's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about like we we don't have this particular type of data. And so we don't know where we lie in this whole plane of results because we're missing this one key piece of understanding. And if you're talking to a policymaker or other decision maker, like those are the conclusions that they can do something about. Like when we're talking to Bill Gates and we say, we don't know this one thing, he says, okay, well, let's go collect that data. Then we can do a better job. Or if you're talking to a policymaker and you say, we don't know if people are behaving this way or that way, they can say, okay, those are the kind of things that I can like have some influence over. So I think rather than, I mean, still the figures are of course important. So don't want to say we shouldn't make good figures that communicate the results clearly, but also we should try to focus more on what that uncertainty means rather than just having it as like a side effect of modeling. There's, there's a interesting example, um, and I read this in, in a book by David Spiegelhalter, where in Florida, I, I understand they have hurricane issues and they have these trajectories that show the evolution of the, the, the kind of path of the hurricane. And, and so what you have in this, in this figure is a kind of median trajectory as well as a confidence interval with the shaded region. And an issue that happened was that people who lived in the shaded region but who weren't on the median path would just not leave because mm -hmm. they you know, didn't quite expect or understand the, the uncertainty. And so there are organizations that have made explicit efforts for not giving um, a median yeah. or like a single number. So the Bank of England, they have these projections about how things evolve in the future and they don't give median estimates. They just give fan charts that kind of, um, and then the, the IPCC, of course, as well, has like a likely range and so on. And um, if they don't have enough evidence or, or is there, if there's disagreement about the evidence, they just give kind of a range. I think something that you both just said, which is really interesting, which is that uncertainty is actionable in a lot of cases. And I think that's that's not a message that we often hear. We, we often hear um, scientists are coming in to talk to policymakers and they're just going to caveat everything to death so that nothing is actionable. But what you've just, you've just turned that on its head and said, actually, the uncertainty is what we can do something with. We can tell people to evacuate from a hurricane zone, or we can say, you know, okay, we, we, we can answer your question, but we need X, Y, and Z. So I think that's, that's a really cool insight. Um, questions from everybody. It's been a great discussion. I want to make sure we can open it up. Dan. There's an organization in the political science world called Bridging the Gap. 
and they try to connect academics with policymakers in, in the field. You know, in my field, that's that's not very connected. And one of the recommendations from their seminars is policymakers don't want to see your regression tables. Like hide hide the yeah. science, hide the uncertainty. And this is again perhaps a place that's less developed. Oh. Perhaps this is a, a field that's less developed than, than some others, but I I, um, I struggle with it in my in, in my own work of. Okay, the question for you is: How do you see your responsibility to meet policymakers halfway and say, "No, no, no, ma'am, let me explain to you the science here and and why you need to understand this," but stop short of. All right, let me let me bring you back to statistics 101 and and go through you know like you know th theory here. So how, how do you, how do you in your own work engage with educating somebody that perhaps has less less issue area expertise? Um, yeah, I again have the benefit of talking to policymakers who were predisposed to want to talk about science, so that was definitely an advantage. And I think I. I do use more technical language than I would just talking to the public. Like I'd use a term like confidence intervals when I'm talking to the governor, but it's still at a pretty basic level. Like I think it's part of our responsibility as the ones communicating science to find a way to talk about complex models in a way that someone who's not a scientist can understand. And that's very challenging, but I think that's I don't I haven't seen good examples of other ways to do it besides finding easy ways to talk about it. Do you guys have? Don't have much time. Um, I mean, I I think yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't have any deep insight on this, but I, I do think that like it varies by a policymaker, right? And I I think there's something to be said about you're right, like not, um, you know, not having not not showing them all the science and whatever, but. One of the things I found at least is perhaps trying to give the policymaker something they can use when they explain their decision. You know what I mean? So, so you can explain your math to them, but what then they need to do is they need to explain to their constituents or the public, like why they made the decision and what does the math mean? So explaining that language to them on what they can say uh, to the public, I found often helps because then they're like, oh, wait, but I want to say it this way. Is there any science you can tell me that can help me say it this way? And and so I, I think like taking the next step with them often often helps like in what you want to communicate to them. I think that goes back to one of the first points that we talked about, which is like fi quickly figuring out how to start where they are in terms of their scientific interest, scientific literacy, and then kind of dancing back and forth until you can find the, the right kind of zone of communication. Other questions? Jordan. That was a great panel. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, maybe a little targeted to you. I'm interested in the dynamic of kind of purposefully not forecasting the reality that you expect to occur. And I'm interested in hearing how you and your agency think about uh, kind of closing your own learning loop when you know that a lot of dynamics are going to kind of necessarily make you incorrect. How do you understand how to improve? How do you think about how you did on any given prediction? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, maybe a little bit of it is, I guess, subconscious. <laughs> so, so I think one of the things is every time we we're building, and you know, we primarily are like a mathematically modeled quantitative building thing, right? Like anytime we're considering any factor, um, we try and figure out if there's any bias in that factor at all uh, with regards to policy. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act that just came out that had a lot of provisions in it that you know not only were new policy, but the policy implementation um, can also vary. So loan guarantees is one example that you often have a loan guarantee that the that the a particular DOE office or some other office has to implement in a particular way. If that mechanism hasn't been decided by that office, we're not going to even model it. We're going to say we, we're not even going to try and assign a probability if that office succeeds or doesn't succeed. And so even though we really want to, we really want to say that like, yes, this loan guarantee will have an impact on emissions. By putting that input in there, we know automatically that we're trying to pick out a policy mechanism that hasn't been decided yet. And so one of the things we do is we very clearly go through each of our model inputs and is like, 
does this involve any assumption? Of course, we make assumptions on everything, but if the assumption involves anything related to policy, that's the one that we then very clearly state we can't even put this input into our model. And so it is difficult because it is like, you know, it ends up showing our results sometimes, which, you know, like under predict certain things or over predict other things. But it is, it, do, it is helpful for us to clearly sort of make that delineation um, because then we have a clear explanation of what's going on. But yeah, it's, it, it goes back to the inputs is, is where we make that decision. Mm -hmm. Hey, great, great panel, guys. I know you guys were uh, talking about striding towards humility. I just want to say for the EIA, I'm a huge fan. Your time varying prediction intervals helped me uh, install something similar for my agency. So hopefully I uh, worked against your efforts there a little bit. But that's the best compliment you can give a modeler. <laughs> Um, something we've been struggling with um, that I'm sure you guys are too is, is we use Monte Carlo simulations to um, develop time-varying prediction intervals that go forward. If we use data going far back enough to the pre-COVID era, it just does not reflect the volatility that we're seeing right now. And so that sort of, you know, in terms of accurately conveying uncertainty, I think that we're understating the current uncertainty in the system by having those years 2012 through 2020 in there or early 2020. Uh, have you guys thought about ways of tackling this problem of rapid shifts in volatility? I know it can be hard with scarce data and things like that, but I just was curious what sort of efforts your agency was making uh, in that, towards that. So, um... I think the and you know this is going back to the to the morning talk, um, which like scenario analysis of extreme cases, that's one way we've done it. I know that's not the best way to think about it, but but often like kind of saying like, all right, what are the real bounding cases, right? And really presenting them as bounding cases, even though they're very extreme. Um, that's been some of the things we've done. Now it's and we have to be a little careful because. We don't want to put a bounding case out there that's so extreme <laughs> that people are often, you know, and, and sometimes we have gotten feedback like that, like that would never happen. And lo and behold, it's happening today, right? Like it's, it's, you know, the US, there's no way that the US is going to become an oil ex, you know, <laughs> we're doing that now. Now we're, we're, the, we're among the largest in the world, not the largest in the world now. So, so yeah, it's, it's, I, I think the harder part for us is like kind of balancing also the communication that's happening there. But you know some of these like feedback loops and things that are extreme uncertainty. Uh, no, that's that's like more into the theoretical math realm that we haven't really like meaningfully tackled. Yeah. Thank you very much. So Rob, you said Rob. I feel like that might be something that the rest of you deal with too. If anyone else on the panel wanted to touch on that before we go to Gaia. So there's this distinction between model uncertainty and like parameter uncertainty, where you know, if you have a shift like this, maybe your model, your, you know, data generating process is different. It's not just reflected by a change in parameters. And so this is often something that, you know, people who do modeling work are challenged, are like, you know, challenged by a really nice example that I heard recently was of the idea of you're driving on a highway, you see, you know, headlights in front of you in the dark. And when there's just normal weather conditions, the you know the intensity of the light decays with the inverse square of the distance, but when there's fog, it you know it decays with the exp exponential of the distance, right? And so you have this model where you think that things are you know this far away. You see a car in front of you. You you think you can see a car like 100 meters in front of you, but turns out there's fog, so you just totally like don't see anything, and you like suffer the consequences, right? Um, and so. It's it's this you know it's 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 this very important problem to try to identify when like your model is no longer appropriate for a certain setting, and one way to do this is just to reflect this in your parameter uncertainty, just kind of blow up your parameters or whatever, which you know I, I see sometimes happen, but I just don't find this a very satisfactory solution. I I'm curious, yeah, I don't have a good, um, yeah, I mean there's there's really interesting statistical work here for identifying these changes, but um, yeah, this seems like a an important problem that I face when I think about the future of AI when like the model uncertainty seems to like overwhelm. Yeah. Hello, 
Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Oh, no, thanks for a really great discussion. I, I want to, I, I, you, you've touched on this a little bit, but I want to, I, I suppose, make, make the question explicit and then ask what I think is a related question. But um, can you talk a little bit about the expectation for acceptance of appetite for multiple projections as opposed to a single number? You've touched on that a little bit. And then, uh, Saleh, um, the, the way you talk about policy, isn't there a massive status quo bias built into to what you're saying by that the base case is always do nothing as opposed to, you know, acting and, and seeing what, you know, what, what the world looks like compared to that. So I think those are related questions. But anyway, so let me pose them as separate ones. <laughs> Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think I talked a little bit about the first one already, but I I think I have found that the audiences that we're talking to are very open to having multiple projections. And it seems pretty, I mean, with creating the right types of figures and text and whatever, but people seem like it's, it. people can understand that there are multiple things that could happen and we're projecting different results based on different things that could happen. So that part has seemed pretty good. Like same thing with showing confidence intervals, like people can understand what that means for the most part. Like we're not generally talking to the general public. So the hurricane thing, <laughs> maybe not representative, but um, yeah, so I've, I've had success with that there. I have definitely seen that status quo bias. Um, although in COVID, that maybe it's not the best example. So <laughs> people were maybe more open to change than otherwise. Do you want to sure. add? Yeah. Um, did you want to? Uh, no. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, uh, so, so I agree. Like we've, whenever we've put out multiple projections, people love it. People always want more. They're like, give us more. Like, I want to see what happens in this. I want to explore this. I want to see the range. You know, it's, it's, it's really like out there. I mean, and, and sometimes, I mean, you know, as a modeler, it's easy for you to draw a line <laughs> and then just say like, that's the line. Um, I've often found the harder part becomes when the next question is, well, which line is more likely? And then you have to explain that every line has a probability of zero happening. So nothing is likely. <laughs> so, 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 you know, getting, getting those concepts of all, but, but yeah, like I, I've often found those are, those are better. Like people often look at those better. And, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I hope I remember Aaron, right? Yeah. We, he, he said something really interesting related to your second point about the status quo, right? Like, um, so our customers or the, our stakeholders who are private companies, they often work in efficient markets. And I'm really just borrowing Aaron's words here. And they really are, you know, into efficient markets and like, so status quo and like kind of how markets work and our projections for them are very easy, right? Like they just incorporate it, they like this going forward. On the other hand, government has a role to actually change the current dynamic, right? The whole point of creating new policy is you create new equilibria that new policies can go towards. And I, and I think Aaron made this really interesting point at our, um, when we were having lunch is like, often for government, you have to think about a different type of model. Like it's not the type of model that can just stick to the status quo. So really figuring out how you can push your models in that direction is very, very important. And I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, if you, if you often say, oh, this is my reference case, <laughs> you know, that already sort of sets the stage for just having that bias in there. And I think, um, you know, what you were talking about, like not even drawing the reference case, like don't even give them a reference case, right? Like tell them like, these are the possibilities that you can control and you can do. Um, don't even think about what might happen if you don't do anything. Think about what could happen if you did do something. I think that would be a good path forward. Uh, and, and since people do have the appetite for all these different scenarios and cases, I think that might actually be a good way to, to move this. I think Gaia, you had the last one. Uh, so first I just wanna say, I love that you, you guys sort of talked about this idea of foxes and hedgehogs without actually mentioning them. Um, you were uh, you were talking, Marita, about the trade-off between sort of not being on the front page of the New York Times by actually couching the language and the communication strategy around your model with humility. And humility is sort of like one of the themes that you guys are, are, are describing. So I, I think that that's very interesting. I sort of wonder what, like, what does that say about our society <laughs> that when we actually, you know, communicate the degree of confidence that is appropriate, that that 
somehow decreases like the signal boosting um, that that happens. So that's so I just want to shout out that like I, this sort of like emerged in in the discussion, and I think it's I think it's like an open question for us as a community around around how do how do we do that better? How do we change that culture? Um, I also just want to highlight that you, when you guys were talking about trust building, I didn't hear you say like accuracy or track record, and I thought that was fascinating. There are other things uh, that trust is being built on, and um, and that's another sort of open question that I have is, you know, I would love to sort of shift the culture toward, okay, well, um, what is the appropriate model for this context? How do we know? What are we basing that trust on? It, like scientifically, mathematically, statistically, um, as part of, you know, how do we actually then leverage? Yes, there's important relationships, there's conversation, there's, you know, trust building that happens at a human level. And how do we then sort of bridge that human trust building context to also be, um, you know, building that trust at a scientific level? Um, so that's kind of an open question. So, and my third, my third point is actually a question, <laughs> but I just want to highlight these things. I think they're, I love that you guys are talking about them. Um, so especially sort of in this context, Sally, you're talking about, you know, modeling the future of the entire sort of state of the energy economy in, in, at a, at a national level. And often you're not modeling, you know, policy action being taken. So I'm curious for you and for the whole panel, how do you think about the difference between a forecast, which is this is what we think is likely to happen and something that is conditional on an action being taken. And do you have the sort, do you draw a bright line between those two things? How do you, how do you think about communicating that bright line? Is that something that actually makes sense to your audiences or do those things kind of get blurred together? What are, where, what is the state of the art? Yeah, I, I'm also curious what the state of the art is. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I guess, obviously, the IPCC has done a bunch of really good work where they have these various abatement paths and they have some business as usual path and they kind of showcase the value of these interventions. And this is something that I'm experimenting with in some of the work that I do on AI to try to give a good sense of what, you know, interventions might look and what effects they might have on the economy and on automation and things like this. Um, I guess I'm going to try to figure this out and <laughs> get back to you if I have a better answer. Sure. Yeah, I'm gonna give kind of a winding path response, but it was kind of a winding path question, so I think it's okay. <laughs> um, so starting with your third point, we never gave the, this is what things are going to be forecasts. We only gave the conditional what could happen type of questions. Um, so I don't have an answer for how those can compare, but we did have a lot of success. Like that's that's what people wanted to know anyway. Like that's what policymakers wanted to know is if I did this thing, what would happen? And part of the reason we didn't do the pre more precise forecasting is because Epi models are very bad at that. And we now that we have had some time of COVID models, there's recently been quite some some quite good reviews of how well COVID models did. And they're terrible, like really like negative skill levels. Like we would have been better off just predicting that COVID would stay the same tomorrow as it is today for the most part. Of course, there are some models that are better. What I think there's some that are more specific settings that are better, but even the better models, it's skill of like less than 0.2. It's really very bad. So, and that's not the same for all, some diseases uh, for various reasons, you can model a little better. But I think like to, to your first points, I think uh, we don't have, the right incentive for modelers to get better at that um, because we don't, in, in 
in epi modeling, we don't evaluate ourselves that way. Like we don't measure our own accuracy as a culture. Like there are of course modeling groups that do that, um, but it's not expected. It's not done regularly. So without that, the incentive is just for you to have a flashy model that gives headline results. So of course, that's what people are gonna do. Like you have to get funding in academia. Like that's modeling groups have to be able to continue doing modeling. So I think until we change that culture that uh, there is an, an incentive to have a good model rather than just a flashy model, then I don't think that's gonna change. All right, let me see if I can go linearly. Um, <laughs> so the to the foxes and the hedgehogs, like I think, I think it's hard to say that what society does right now is bad. Like I feel like in many ways it's good that some people are making those headlines. You know what I mean? Because it brings modeling into the mainstream and makes starts people talking about it. So I don't know. It's it's hard for at least me to pass a judgment on like how do we change this or not. It's just this is where we are in society. And in you know in some ways I try to look at the positive of it. Like okay, at least someone's talking about this now. Like someone's making this. Right, exactly. <laughs> Some of them don't have anything at all, right? But that's that's just how we work nowadays, and and we have to take it with what it is, right? And 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 yes, there's there's ways to dispute that and stuff. So I, I agree with you that, but I don't know if there's like judgment of if it's good or bad. Um, to your second question about we didn't mention accuracy or anything else like that, um, I feel like that's your fault and your morning talk because you said that forecasting is learning. You didn't say forecasting is about predicting an exact number, and so if forecasting is learning, and I really thought that was very insightful because like if forecasting is learning, then we shouldn't be forecasting for an accuracy or anything like that. We should be forecasting so that we can learn more. And so metrics of learning in my mind are way more important than metrics of accuracy or anything else like that. Um, and, and you know, that's at least what I got from your morning talk. So thank you, thank you. I threw that back right at you. And then to your, to your, <laughs> to your last thing of like, how do you go between like, forecasting a number versus answering these what if questions I think it depends like certain people like our certain of our stakeholders are like give me the natural gas price in 2050 I need to calculate a net present value I need one number don't give me like the range and sure you can give them that range but they're for policymakers especially like often if it's something that the number is bad like your amount of carbon emissions, or if the oil price is way too high, then it's like, okay, give me the what if answer, right? <laughs> and so I do think there's places for both of those. And, and I think people have an appetite depending on what their goals are. Um, you know, if they wanna change things, they wanna talk about changing things, then some of that second type of analysis gets, gets much better. But the first one is also important. It's important to have that number. <laughs> like a very dark example. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Make my policy look better. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we are going to transition to a break now. I wanna say thank you to the panel. This was a fantastic discussion and encourage the um, everyone listening to take a moment to jot down anything you heard that you wanna kind of take back to your work for a minute before you go to break, if that's um, inspiring to you. Um, but again, thank you. And um, yeah, there's a lot, to, a lot to chew on here. So thanks, thanks again. <laughs> Okay, so we have our second facilitated exercise now. And similar to the last time, although you do not perhaps need to reintroduce yourselves to your table mates unless you want to or have switched tables, in which case absolutely do so. But we have two questions for you to consider. The first of which is, you know, what did you learn today that you hope to bring back to your organization? Um, I will leave these up. We will rotate through them. Um, things that you, uh, your agency can do to adopt forecast to support decision making. These will be the topics of discussion. And then, you know, last but certainly not least on the on the sticky notes that you have, we are eager to know what you would like to get from this community going forward and, and how to develop it. So we'll take the next half an hour or so to, to go through these. There is a facilitator at each table. Yes. One last thing. Yes. Are there others in terms of researchers or policymakers who you would like us to invite? Yes, absolutely. So if there are folks, okay, if there are people who you think would be interested in participating and joining this community going forward, 
please list them. We would love to reach out to them. Um, and, and that will, will help the network grow, obviously. So with that, we will begin with our first four, our first forecasting question. Sorry, I've been doing this a little too long. We'll begin with our first discussion question. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. So um, we are ending uh, not with a whimper, but a bang uh, tonight. Um, so it's been a fascinating day and this is our, our last session and it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce to, to colleagues, um, Greg Laughlin, who is a professor of astronomy at, at Yale, but also a founder of Metaculus, uh, and Lawrence Phillips, who is our AI forecasting lead. And they're going to talk about how we are incorporating large language models into forecasting, talk a bit about the, the potential, what we've, what we've done to date, where we are going, and, and some of the promise that this shows. So with that, um, let me turn things over to Greg. Greg, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen here. Um, I mean, I think that it should be up. You should be able to see the title slide there. Is, is that right? Oh, I see a thumbs up. It's it's always a yes. little bit disconcerting to give a, a talk when you can't see the audience, but I'm I'm just envisioning thousands and thousands of people uh, ready to to hear this talk. And I want to stress that I'm really kind of the, the opening act here. My my job is just to set context and to really uh, kind of highlight and get people warmed up for the incredible things that that Lawrence is going to demo for us. Um, so as mentioned before, I'm a co-founder of Metaculus. I've had a long running interest in both prediction and language models. Uh, one of my interests is in prediction on extremely short timescales. So I'm interested in high frequency trading and understanding what's going to happen in the next millisecond or two. And I also have a history of trying to make forecasts for the extreme, extreme, extreme distant future. Um, I'm a co-author of a book called The Five Ages of the Universe, which uh, talks about what will happen in timescales in which you need 100 zeros after the one to describe the number of years. So today's work is really about kind of the intermediate scale, but what's gonna happen in the next weeks, months, and uh, years. And so this slide I put together this morning and getting ready for the talk. And what I've done here is I've just looked at the Google search term for artificial intelligence, and I've plotted, the interest in artificial intelligence in the internet community over the last five years. And what you see is that the blue line is kind of bouncing along at a steady, steady rate. And then in November of 2022, November of last year, it starts to take off. And I've also plotted two other, two other search terms. One is a GPT-3. This is OpenAI's uh, language model that was the first to really start to gain attention. And you see it spiking up in uh, 2020 there in red. And then GPT-4, the yellow line, is spiking up in April of this year. And you can see that uh, also when chat GPT was announced, uh, there was a spike in interest. And over the past few weeks, as you can gather by looking at the media, as you can gather from cocktail party conversations, AI has become the talk, not just of DC, but of every town. And what's interesting is that this all stems from what appeared to be sort of an obscure paper at the time. This uh, paper that was written by researchers at Google in June of 2017, which introduces the transformer architecture. And what the transformer architecture does, if you're not familiar with this, it, is it simply provides a method of looking at text and then predicting the next character. Doesn't seem like you know a, a huge advance. It seems almost like a parlor trick. And I, I've been interested in this for, for, for quite a while in the, the, the idea of looking at text and then predicting the next character. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, is a snippet from a blog post that I wrote in 2017 using the kind of machine learning models that were popular before the transformer came out. And you know, you can see some code snippet there. And what I was trying to do was trying to 
write a model that would sound like Oscar Wilde, uh, that would say clever things. And it was an absolute failure. Um, so what it was able to do is it was able to string words together into entities that looked like sentences, but the sentences made absolutely no sense. And it in 2017, it was absolutely inconceivable that this kind of predictive mechanism was going to have any utility, much less that in five years, you know, we'd all literally be talking about predicting the next character. And so fast forwarding to today, um, there was a an amusing cartoon in, in the New Yorker uh, two weeks ago uh, in, the, in the top right there, which is incredibly timely and is both funny and perhaps not funny. And then I, uh, in the lower right-hand corner, I just clipped out of the New York Times today's big article on artificial intelligence. This, there's nothing special about today's article every day in the New York Times and the major newspapers has a big article about our artificial intelligence. It's this huge, huge uh, sort of innovation that is having immense cultural impact. And the question is, is what is what is going to happen next? We've gone so far in the last five years. Uh, what is what is going to happen next? And so given that that we have Metaculus and given that we have AIs, it's a natural thing to do to simply ask the AI what what it thinks. And so um, as soon as the GPT-4, this new AI from OpenAI came out, I was eager to see whether it could predict on Metaculous questions. And right out of the box, I was kind of stunned by its ability. The uh, text there on the left-hand side of the screen kind of shows a conversation with the artificial intelligence asking it to predict uh, when SpaceX is going to uh, accomplish various various parts of its mission. And I was kind of amazed by the thoughtfulness of its answers. Uh, GPT-4 not only will make predictions, but it will also explain its predictions and it will give the, the justification for why it's forecasting the numbers that it, it gives. And so the big picture question, of course, is you know, how fast are things going to progress? And in particular, when is this entity called weak artificial general intelligence going to arrive? A weakly general artificial intelligence is one that has kind of human or better level capabilities in most tasks and can do things like put Legos together or robotic tasks, it can kind of handle itself in a multimodal way. It can take visual input, it can take audio input, it can speak, it can write, it can do things. And this for most of my life, for most of everybody's life, has been something that's completely futuristic, something that is almost completely in the realm of, of, of science fiction. And if you go back to a little more than a year ago, to September 2021, um, this is when the training data for the new OpenAI artificial intelligence cuts off. And so GPT-4 basically had a image of everything that was on the internet. It could think about everything that was on the internet, everything that was current up until September, 2021, but then it loses context. It doesn't know anything that has happened after September, 2021. It's kind of like a Rip Van Winkle in that respect. And so if we go back and we look at what the metaculous prediction was, what the community of forecasters was predicting as to when artificial, weekly general artificial intelligence would arrive. Predictors, the community, and this includes many artificial intelligence and language model experts, were predicting that this would come around in, in 2042, so still comfortably far off in the future. And then over, over the past year or so, this prediction has come down dramatically. And so right now on Metaculus, or as of a few days ago on Metaculus, the prediction of when weekly general AI is going to arrive is now down literally to the end of 2026. So in just a few years, because of the advent of the transform model and because of the amazing successes that these programs have had, this timeline has been compressed radically from 2042 down to the current prediction of 2026. So it's interesting to ask the GPT-4 AI, what it thought of based on its knowledge from, from late 2021. And the answer was quite remarkable. So GPT-4 predicted 
that weekly general AI would arrive in 2030. And that was a dozen years ahead of what the community was predicting at that time. And this, this absolutely stunned me. This one result was just completely amazing to me. It was like it came up with a number, with a date that was prescient, that was much earlier than what the community of human predictors was thinking. And this kind of galvanized me to you know, take a huge interest in the, um, the work that, that Lawrence is going to show you and the, in the, the, the efforts that Lawrence is going to talk to you about. And these are efforts in which the GPT-4 is basically marshaled to collaborate with other instances of its own kind uh, to make predictions that uh, look like they may be very startlingly accurate. So Lawrence, do you wanna take over and show them how it works? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, Let me stop sharing here. Yeah, I'll just uh, start sharing. Okay, it says your screen share is loading. There we go. Um, can everybody see? Okay, I'm not hearing any no's, so I'll take that. Great. Um, yeah, so as, um, as Greg mentioned, uh, we've been doing a little bit of work recently on um, a a uh, large language model based um, forecasting system. And I'm going to give you a quick uh, demo and sort of technical overview slash explanation of, um, of what we've done. So on the left, you see this rather crude um, prototype dashboard, um, which is where we'll interact with the system and look at its outputs. And on the right, that's just my terminal where the logs um, from the back end are getting streamed um, just so you can peek into what's going on behind the scenes a little bit and to make it a bit less boring because it can stream um, its outputs to the logs but not to the dashboard. Um, so we'll look at one and hopefully two questions um, if, if we have time, um, just as examples. Um, starting with starting with this one on uh, People's Republic of China and um, Taiwan. So here we see, yeah, this is this is a question that is um, currently on um, Metaculus. Um, title is, will the People's Republic of China annex at least half of Taiwan before 2050? Um, and then here are, here are the resolution criteria. Um, so yeah, question resolves yes, if any of the following occur before 1st of January, 2050. And then, you know, we have three bullet points here. Basically, they're just saying um, if there are five sort of credible news articles published that state that um, you know China controls half of Taiwan, um, be it population-wise or um, territorially, then the question is going to resolve yes. Otherwise, no. Um, so we can go ahead and um, ask uh, the system, which we've called uh, Episto. Um, what what it thinks the forecast on this question should be. Okay. So now it is going to think about what action it needs to take. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of pre-baked in actions that it, that it can take, including um, looking at the research that it's done on the current question and uh, producing a forecast, and it should decide to do that. Um, however, it seems not to be doing anything. Uh, the joys of the life demo. Just give me one second here. Let me just interrupt this and start it again. Apologies for that. Okay, here we go. So, decides what to do, realizes it needs to look at its pre-done research. Um, so it looks at that behind the scenes and it comes up with a forecast based on, based on this. Um, so it's at 25% here. 
Um, there is variability in its forecasts uh, between runs. So um, yeah, I've run this a few times. Uh, generally, it's around 20%, sometimes as low as 15%. 25 is a little bit on the high side um, compared to what it usually produces. But anyway, this is um, its prediction. So it gives a bit of reasoning. Um, it says that China's uh, made significant advances in its military capabilities, which is indeed true, um, showing increased assertiveness towards Taiwan, which is indeed true. Geopolitical situation involving the US and other powers make it difficult to predict. Fair enough. Um, yeah, so it's quite sort of succinct and um, yeah, not 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 necessarily all that detailed reasoning that it's providing here, um, but you can get it to go into much greater depth um, if you so please, and we'll 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 do that um, a little bit later. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the long and short of the the forecast thing. Um, it looks pretty simple, um, but I do want to point out that there's quite a lot going on. Um, behind the scenes here, and there's a fair bit of preparation that um, goes into getting the thing into the state where it can actually make forecasts like this. Um, and yeah, the, and, and the reason that, that such preparation is necessary, um, or one of the reasons is that, um, as, as, as Greg pointed out, um, LLMs actually have a pretty serious um, shortcoming that it's re that's relevant for um, actually a, a, a very large number of use cases, um, and you know forecasting is very much in in that category. Um, and that shortcoming is the the sort of knowledge cutoff. Um, so you know these systems tend to be aware of events up to a certain point. Um, in the case of GPT four, up to September twenty twenty one, and then effectively blind to everything that has happened after that point. Um, it's interesting to note that this isn't quite true um, exactly. So up-to-date information can leak into, um, into these models. Um, there have been sort of tweets and, and articles um, claiming to, uh, you know, where, where the author claims to have elicited um, up-to-date knowledge from ChatGPT. Um, for example, you know, at some point people were able to um, get it to say that the, the 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 CEO of Twitter is Elon Musk, which obviously was not the case in September 2021. Um, and you know, it seems to know about you know a few things about um, more than U.S. politics. You know, pol political events that have occurred after 2021 as well. And you know, this this probably is due to um, the fact that OpenAI updates their models. Um, based on the feedback that they receive from from users, um, you know, every, every now and then, and you also have this um, reinforcement learning from human feedback stage uh, that happens in training after the sort of next word prediction stage, and you know, this um, stage can can leak up to date information into the model as well, which confounds um, analyses that are based purely on um, you know historic data somewhat. But anyway, to, to a first approximation and, you know, pretty much for all intents and purposes, really, the thing is blind um, to, to up-to-date information. So um, obviously for probably the vast majority of forecasting questions of interest, um, this is this is far from ideal and we need a way of, of, um, of remedying that. Um, so one, one big thing we're doing here is, um, you know, gathering relevant up-to-date information and uh, you know, presenting it to to the model. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, using informative, using uh, metaculous questions that we think are informative as inputs to the model. Um, so metaculous questions actually can be very sort of succinct, information rich uh, representations of of uh, relevant knowledge. Um, you know, you can think of them as ways of compressing. Uh, large amounts of information down into their sort of essential um, implications, and so um, you know I think you, you can you can give the model a rather easier time rather than having it synthesize you know a really really large amount of rel uh, relevant information and figure out what its implications for the forecast at hand are. Um, if you present it with a number of well chosen metaculous questions as well, um, you know this can significantly well, potentially significantly, um, well, give it an easier time and and hopefully make its forecasts more 
um, more more accurate. Uh, so yeah, th those are basically the, the two the two things we're doing. And I'm going to just show you a little bit of code and a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes here. So let me just bring up. I have to change Git branches because things are a little bit hacky at the moment. So forgive me. Yeah, so I'm going to show you the pipeline that we have that um, produces those sort of pre-prepared outputs that I that I mentioned. So the up-to-date research and the um, and the, uh, the informative miraculous questions. Excuse me. There we go. Okay, so if this behaves itself, yeah, we can see the um, the. So this is the the data engineering tool that we're using to manage the pipelines for this project, and so we can see, um, well, yeah, ignore all this stuff up here. Essentially, the pipeline, the section of the pipeline that's relevant for this application, is is down here. And um, yeah, really the, the meat of it begins at this stage. Um, so this arm on the left here is the up-to-date research business. And this arm on the right is the um, informative, metaculous questions business. Um, so I'll start by talking about the, um, the part on the left, the up-to-date research. Um, so yeah, this stage here. Uh, so obviously if we're going to um, present the model with up relevant up-to-date information, uh, like what what should we actually be presenting it with? What should we what should we look for? Um, so in this stage, we take in a metaculous question and we have um, GPT four essentially generate a number of um, sub questions that it thinks it needs to know about in order to make um, you know a well informed up to date forecast. So we tell it, okay, GPT four, your knowledge cuts off in September twenty twenty one. This is the question that we're interested in getting a forecast on. Give me a number of um, research questions uh, that you would like us to go go away and find you the, the answers to. And then you can use those later on to inform your forecast. And then it goes and generates um, a list of, a list of uh, research questions for us. So that's this stage. Um, then at the next stage, so this is the, the sort of the most interesting and probably the most technically, technically involved stage. Um, at this stage, we spin up a number of uh, autonom autonomous research agents um, that are actually based on on GPT-4, um, but it, but they're they're kind of like a you know what what people are calling a scaffolded LLM system um, the, these days, and so each each of these research agents um, goes and uh, basically searches the internet and looks at web pages and um, you know compiles evidence. And then eventually kind of produces an answer to to the research question that it's been assigned. Um, so to give you a little bit more of an idea of how this stage works, we can actually look at a little bit of code here. Um, so let's see, yeah, research.py sounds like the right module. Right, yeah. So there isn't a single function that I can show you that really sort of um shows you how the thing is working step by step. It's a little bit abstracted away, but I think this one could, you know, is good enough that it can drive my um, talking about this. So uh, yeah, effectively um, the first stage here is building up a, a prompt for the model. Um, and you'll notice we have this, this tools variable. So what are tools? Um, tools are, Effectively, functions that the the LLM can can interact with um, dynamically, uh, and so so the way this works is um, for e for each function that the model can access or for each tool that it can access, um, we provide the name of that tool, um, we provide the a description of that tool, so what the tool does um, to the model. Uh, you can't see the descriptions here; they're hidden away somewhere, but they do exist. Um, and then we construct a prompt based on those tools. And what that prompt looks like is effectively it says, okay, model, your goal is to answer this question. Insert, you know, research question. Um, you have access to the, the following set of tools. 
And then, you know, you give it a list of, of the tools that you've initialized here um, and, and a description of how the tools work and how the model should, should use them. And then you say, okay, I want you to use the, the, the following format. Um, first of all, you should think about what you need to do next, which is kind of a weird thing to, to tell the model to do. Um, but generally like this, this improves performance. You ask it to kind of write down a thought about what it wants to do next as its, as its first step. Um, then tell me the name of the tool that you want to use. And then tell me the input that you want to give to that tool. Um, then uh, you will receive an observation coming back from that tool. Um, and then you can you can undergo this uh, thought um, tool uh, observation loop as many times as you like until you have you either kind of decide that you know the answer to the question um, or you decide that you want to give up um, and, and then the, the, the loop terminates. Um, so that this function here basically creates that that prompt for the model. And then we have this agent executor business. And what that does is manages that interaction loop that I just mentioned. So um, it feeds the initial prompt to the model. And at the like, and the model will start to complete the complete the prompt. Um, and what it will do is it will follow the format that you've specified and it will first generate a thought. Um, and then it will choose a tool and it will like uh, specify what input it wants to give to that tool. Um, if it behaves itself well, which it doesn't always do, but most of the time it does. Um, and then at the point where it's specified its tool and the input it wants to use uh, to give to that tool, um, the, the framework here is going to actually like pass that output. So um, it's going to take, it's going to understand what tool has been requested. Um, and it's going to call a function that is associated with that tool um, with the input that the model provided. So for instance, if the model has requested the Google search tool, um, then the framework is actually going to call the Google API um, with the query that the model has uh, um, specified. And it's going to like retrieve the results from Google and create a new prompt with those results as the observation that the model sees. And then the loop goes again. So now the model can see its previous action, the observation that resulted from that action. And it has to generate a new thought, choose a new tool, Get a new observation, and that loop just keep, keeps on um, keeps on looping until the model decides to give its 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 final answer. So, yeah, that's how the um, research agent business is is working. Um, and yeah, we're we're like using asynchronous code, so we can spin up a whole bunch of these at one time, um, and you know they can they can operate in uh, concurrently. Um, okay, so that's the left hand side. Um, the right hand side is about finding uh, informative metaculous questions. So just to like go over this really quickly, um, the first stage we generate candidates um, questions. Uh, we do that because if we were to run this on all open metaculous questions, um, we'd have like an, an order n squared problem. Like for every question, we have to ask a large language model whether every other question is informative for that question, which is very inefficient. So first of all, we generate candidates based on semantic similarity between um, the question titles and semantic similarity between comments as, as well. Um, given those candidates, we feed the top 50 into an LLM and um, we get it to, to tell us um, which of them it thinks are actually informative for the, the question at hand. Um, and just to show you a little bit of that last part, um, yeah, we actually do that last part in two stages. Um, so yeah, we first kind of ask it for an initial list of the top whatever, 10, in this case, most informative questions, um, generates its list, and then we tell it, okay, so yeah, we, we feed that initial list to a critic model, um, which we tell like, okay, you know, an AI model has generated the list of potentially informative questions um, for the for the question at hand, do any of these stand out as actually not being very informative to you? Um, and for the ones that seem uninformative, please just list them list them below. Um, and this actually improves performance quite a bit. This is a pattern that you that you come across fairly often when working with um, LLMs. You find that their initial outputs 
are like usually pretty good, but also somewhat flawed and contain mistakes. Um, but if you ask the model to then consider what it's just generated and uh, try to improve it, like assume that it's wrong and try and improve it, um, very often it can notice it mis its mistakes and uh, come up with a, a better output after that. Um, and so like, yeah, in our case, this actually does substantially improve performance, at least um, based on the qualitative sort of eyeballing that I've, I've done of, of the results. Okay, so um, that's about it for the sort of technical under the hood deep dive. Um, now I just want to go back to the to the dashboard. I may need to restart it. Let's see if it still works. Because I want to show you some of this um, research uh, that that like just to give you a sense of like what the thing is actually basing its forecast on and like how this autonomous research bot actually works. So if I if I ask the if I ask a piston now, um, can you show me some help for research? Hopefully it will understand that it needs to retrieve the cached research that it did before and show it to us. Yes, indeed, that's what it did. Um, so remember I said the way it works is by generating a set of research questions um, that it wants us to answer, and then we go off and answer them for it. So these are, these are a few of the questions that it generated. Have there been any notable changes in diplomatic relations between China and other countries since 2021? Yep, so it's aware that 2021 is when it kind of stops knowing about stuff. Seems like a pretty reasonable question. Um, and here are the results that came back. It's talking about the Taiwan Tax Agreement Act of 2023. Um, it like references where it found this information from. And you can see that, as far as I can tell, this is, well, yeah, presumably <laughs> this information is actually on this page somewhere. Um, and yeah, more questions. Has there been military conflicts um, between China and Taiwan? Um, and yeah, the bot comes back with yes, there have been a few instances. It talks about Pelosi's visit, um, links to some news articles, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just to show you the very last feature here, um, you can also get it to show you the informative metaculous questions. That it's based its forecast on. I haven't actually checked this one, so I have to see how these are. So here we go. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. Will there be an armed conflict between China and Taiwan? Um, that is going to lead to at least 100 deaths before 2026. China recognizing Taiwanese sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, this is a sample of the sort of up to date information and the informative and tactless questions that have gone into the uh, things, the things initial 25% forecast. And yeah, that is all I've got. Um, so I'll pass it back to Greg. Um, who's going to sort of wrap up and, and, and summarize. Thanks. Thanks, Lawrence. So I don't really have a great read of the room. I know that <clears throat> when you give a talk like this, sometimes it, you know, showing the actual code can kind of cause people to glaze over. But I think it's what Lawrence has just shown is incredibly interesting and important because what we're seeing for the first time is the interactions that normally are in the human domain, the interactions of group decision-making of group problem solving are now being accomplished by literal artificial intelligences. And so we see just tremendous synergy uh, starting to develop because if you bring human forecasters into this loop, then you get all of the power of speed and depth and scope of the artificial intelligence with the still preeminent sort of human logic and decision making. So if I just share my last screen here, um, 
can just show a, a slide as as a takeaway. So I'll play this. What I'm showing here, I actually had GPT for write the code to scrape the website. So there's a website called Top 500. And what that does is over the years, it has given a continual accounting of the 500 fastest supercomputers on earth. And so normally, um, you know, in the last 20 years, the story has been about climate forecasting and large scientific problems. And then recently, the compute has started to go into these language models once it was realized that the transformer algorithm really, really works and the attention mechanism really, really works. Interest has taken off. But if you take a slightly longer view and look over time, this, this chart starts in 2004 and it ends in the present day. And what I'm plotting here on the y-axis is the total number of calculations, the total number of bit operations that the computers can do uh, per second. So this looks like, oh, a slow linear increase. And it is linear on the x-axis. That is, it's unfolding in real time. But each factor, each tick here is a factor of 10. And so in the past 20 years, the amount of computation that these supercomputers have done, and this is representative of all computers, is increased by about a factor of 10,000. Computation just you know, since the Obama regime, um, or regime, the Obama, the Obama administration has, has increased by, by a factor of a thousands. And this shows no sign of, of, of um, turning over. The doubling time is literally measured in days, 542 days. And so what to expect is absolutely critical. And the takeaway, I think, from this talk and from this whole effort is that forecasting is critical because the future really is now. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop sharing and you know, we can open it up to discussion. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Lawrence. Like, absolutely fascinating. I expect there are many questions. So let me open up the floor. Yes. Um, I'm curious what... Well, let, wait for a mic. So they can hear us. Yes. Um, thanks a lot for that. That looks really fascinating. I'm curious if you've um, tested the performance of these systems. I'd be like very keen to see the results and how it compares to human forecasters. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've done some benchmarking, and uh, we intend to we intend to do a lot more. Um, at the moment, our kind of metric of choice, uh, albeit an imperfect one, is um, like the correlation between our system's forecast and the the uh, community prediction on Metaculus, or indeed the Metaculus prediction, seems to correlate about roughly the same with both of them in the uh, experiments that we've that we've tried so far. Um, so the the reason for doing it this way, I mean, you know, a much more sort of uh, like at first glance, straightforward seeming approach would be, you know, to to take questions that may be resolved after the um, the model's kind of knowledge cutoff, and uh, you know, calculate some sort of prior score on 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 those, um, and I think that that evaluation does have its place um, in in our sort of toolkit of uh, for evaluating this thing um but there are a couple of problems with it one is that um as i said earlier up-to-date information does kind of leak into these models so you're never on completely secure footing um you know when you when you when you sort of like rely on the, the knowledge cutoff um there may there may be data leakage um and another thing is uh, so a lot of what we want to be testing about this system is its ability to incorporate, um, you know, up-to-date information via the techniques that we're that we're using. Um, and so, you know, short of creating some sort of, um, you know, way back machine style, like searchable snapshot of how the world was, um, you know, when when the when the models training data cut off. Um, you know that's going to be uh, that's going to be kind of rather 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 hard to do um, via any method other than just like running the thing now and seeing how it compares to um, forecasters with a kind of known a known track record. Um, I can very quickly show you uh, some plots that we have um, that capture this this correlation. Um, in fact, I'd like to show you a set of plots. I think that's probably the best way of doing this because. 
yeah, this set of plots not only gives some sort of notion of uh, how this thing is doing, but also um, also where we might expect it to go as the underlying LLMs uh, in, improve. Okay, so let me just share my screen. So, yeah, this is like um, a scatter plot where we're comparing. Okay, and like, okay, just to say outright, like this is not the final version. This is with a a, a, a worse model. And the point is to illustrate the improvement over time as models develop. So this is with kind of like vanilla um, GPT-3 as the underlying LLM. Um, so on the y-axis, we have the community prediction. On the x-axis, we have the forecast that the system has produced. And uh, each data point is just like a metaculous question that's that's still open. So you can see here, if we're using GPT-3 as the um, underlying LLM, uh, this is like clearly just random performance. There's zero signal whatsoever. Um, if we use GPT-3.5, so that's the version that backed uh, sort of the initial chat GPT um, when, you know, when that took off late last year. Um, we can see that, you know, it's starting to do something like there's definitely some correlation going on here. There's like, you know, it's almost linearly separable. You draw a line on the diagonal from, um, you know, zero, one to, to, to one zero, um, but still not amazing. And then like GPT-4 as the underlying model, um, we see it's, we see it's like pretty clearly correlated. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, one imagines that this will continue to improve, but obviously like past a certain point of correlation is no longer improvement because the CP is, the community prediction is not perfect. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would imagine that with, um, you know, improvements in, in, in models uh, that we can expect to see over the next few years, this will get tighter. And, you know, as, as I said, right at the start, um, this is like a very, preliminary attempts um, on our part as well. So I think, you know, even if we stay with just GPT-4, uh, we can do things to, to tighten this further. Lawrence, you might want to mention the, uh, the over prediction that the community tends to engage in. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll mention that. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't want to oversell this. So make of this, make of this what you will. I'll just share my screen again. Um, but okay, I will I will point out that um, so if you look here, you can kind of see that um, the the model seems to be biased to predicting values that are that are lower than what the community predicts. Um, and you know, if you look at Metaculous, like if you look at the community prediction as a whole, um, it's like clearly biased towards over prediction. So yeah, they predict that you know their their probabilities are basically like reliably too too high um you know that as i say you know make of that what you will um this could be this could be a fluke there aren't that many data points here but it's interesting nonetheless uh thank you lawrence uh next question i'll come back to you Thanks for that presentation. I, I'm just kind of curious, like in the near to midterm, while these tools are still developing and their capabilities, how do you see these kinds of kind of AI-based forecasts integrating with community-based forecasts, model-based forecasts? Do you see them as synergistic or kind of tailored to different contexts and different questions? What are your what are your thoughts? Yeah. That's a very interesting question. Um, so I can see maybe in the, the medium term. Um, so, so I mean, what, what does this AI business buy you? Like, obviously, scalability is, is a huge part of it, right? Like, we're producing these forecasts with, um, you know, like, once the system has been set up, it's very, it doesn't take very much effort at all, or very much money, or very much time to produce uh, a new forecast. And so we can really scale this to many, many thousands of, of questions. Um, and we can answer those questions much, much more quickly than we could with, with, with humans. Um, on the other hand, I mean, given the current system, I very much expect uh, like human forecasters who are trying hard are gonna just do a better job than, than, than what we have. So um, I, you know, one, one way I can see things 
fitting together um, in the early stages is that humans provide uh, a sort of sanity check and also a feedback signal for like you know questions that are asked at, at, at scale so say for instance we have um, a topic of interest and we really want to cover that topic very very exhaustively so we ask a great number of questions uh, about that topic um, and then you know for a select few questions we maybe bring in human forecasters and you know we use their outputs as a kind of diagnostic maybe um, and also, you know, maybe as a way of kind of guiding the the model, getting it to um, reconsider its its reasoning and what it believes is um, important, um, so that it can do a better job on the on the other questions that humans aren't touching. That's one idea. I mean, there are probably many many other ways that the the two can fit together. Greg, did you have anything to add to that? So I think that something that's really, really exciting is that, you know, all the hyperscalers are developing language models and language models are like it being developed, you know, by, by other sources that we don't know about. And the Metaculous framework provides the ability for these models to go in and do a real world task that evaluates their effectiveness. So, you know, we don't know the future. And, you know, we don't know if the humans are over predicting the plot that Lawrence showed or whether that was a statistical anomaly. But what we do know is that, you know, more and more of these agents are, are coming available. And so Metaculous really provides a platform where they can compete, where they can collaborate, and where they can develop track records. And so we can understand what works and what doesn't. And then Metaculous also, of course, because of its kind of collaborative underpinning, provides the perfect framework for human forecasters and uh, machine forecasters to, to, to work together to get the best possible view of what's going to happen. Thank you. Um, yes. So one idea for um, improving some of this might be to use something like reinforcement learning from um, human feedback, where you get the model to make a prediction, you then compare this prediction to what the Metaculous prediction at that point in time is, and then you kind of update it so that it produces something that looks more like the Metaculous prediction, including like reasoning that leads it to create a prediction that's more in line with what we kind of understand is a good prediction. And so that seems like you know a thing that people are using to try to improve the, the performance of these types of models. Um, I, I, th that's one question. The other question is, when is this launching? Because like, I can't, <laughs> can't wait. To using this. Um, yeah, I'll definitely let Gaia handle the, the second. <laughs> but, um, yeah, as, as to the first point, so yeah, there are many, I think there are many technical problems with using RLHF to um, optimize the, 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 the forecasts of, of these systems. Um, so yeah, I mean, for one thing, so like RLHF does not rely on, um, you know, like supervised data. So you don't have sort of labeled data points. What you have is a reward model that has been trained on preferences of, of humans. Um, and, and what that buys you um, is the ability for the, 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 the sort of base model that you're training via RLHF to generate a very, very sort of large number and a, a diverse set of prompt completions that are evaluated by the the reward model um, and and you know used to um, like yeah and those evaluations basically like act as a, a reward function in in the reinforcement learning process. Um, now it's far from clear how you would construct a reward model, um, you know, to kind of like uh, you know mimic uh, what is a good forecast and what is a bad forecast based on um you know the the data from metaculus i really expect the sample complexity of this to be very high um I, meaning that you know we're going to need like a large number of, of data points in order to get ideas like this to to work well as well and um you know i, I just think you know we do have a thousand or so um you know, maybe closer to 2000 these days resolved resolved questions. But, um, you know, to, to, to fine tune an LLM 
um, one one needs quite a lot more. I mean, I I I mean, I presumably, I mean, I'm kind of just guessing here. I obviously you need to run the experiment and see, but um, yeah, my my guess would be that you would need needs rather a lot more. Um, you know, there could well be a role for reinforcement learning um, at the level of like some subcomponent of of or like subcomponents of the system that we eventually end up building. Um, I can imagine, you know, some sort of hybrid system with, you know, learned parameters that, uh, you know, control the behavior of certain components of, of, of the system that are not, you know, really just implemented by the LLM. And maybe those components could could learn potentially via RL, potentially via other methods. Um, but yeah, I don't think RLHF to like guide the LLM towards making forecasts that are more similar to the current uh, community protection or, or this protection probably isn't uh, isn't the isn't isn't the first thing I tried. Uh, plus, uh, one thing that throws another spanner in the works is like you can't do that with. Um, I don't think any of the existing LLM APIs let you like do RLHF. So you'd have to have your own model that you're hosting and then you're training it. And uh, um, yeah, it adds it adds a lot of a lot of complexity. Guy, do you want to add anything? I'll add a couple of things. Yeah, just so Marita brought up earlier on the panel the incentive structure around accuracy. So this is something that you know we think about a lot in Metaculus for human forecasters. And as we're bringing this new AI forecasting system online, I'm very, very interested in this idea of what is the not just reinforcement learning through human feedback, but reinforcement learning through the incentives around being accurate. And I think that this is a really important um, direction for research for us, but and also for the broader sort of AI community as well. Um, and I'll just say, you know, what we've, you guys have seen today is something that is currently in its very sort of early prototype stages. We're excited to kind of like show you where, you know, kind of where things are heading. Um, and, um, if there's interest in sort of early access, we can talk about that. <laughs> uh, but we don't have a release date uh, set yet. Thank you. Uh, yes, right there. So I'm curious, have you guys tried any uh, sort of assessment of the let's call it um, the quantitative reasoning here. So playing around with like uh, the degree to which LLMs appropriately understand, if I'm gonna use that term in the most abusive way I know how, um, <laughs> like sort of basic rules of probability theory or things like this. So if you ask it to make a, for a forecast about two independent events that you believe to be independent for reasons, and you ask it to make about the constituent components of that event, um, does it obey? probabilist like you know uh, multiplicative rules there or other kinds of things like have you tried kind of playing around with this more generally the kind of general degree to which language translation turns into numbers in a way that is meaningfully calibrated i'm curious about that yeah yeah that that's a really fantastic question um so the answer would have been yes if our research scientist had not been on holiday over the last few days um <laughs> That's literally his his current project, and um, he has a pull request open um, with a bunch like implementing a bunch of these benchmarks um, that you know once once we merge it and we run them, um, then yeah we'll have an answer. So we yeah we definitely want to be probing these things, and that's not only on the roadmap, but it's yeah actively um, actively being pursued, and I think would probably be fodder for a pretty interesting research papers as well. Great. Um, we have time for a final question. If there's a final question. Okay, well then please join me in thanking Greg and Lawrence and, and Episto uh, for this demonstration. Thank you all. And what I am going to do as we close out our day is turn things back over to Gaia Dempsey. Gaia. Thank you, Peter. Wow, so I feel like um, I've spent the day sort of perched within an observatory, sort of looking out across the field of forecasting at this very sort of multifaceted, diverse, rich uh, field and, and, and community. Um, and this interesting landscape that we inhabit across the different disciplines that we've brought together. Um, and I feel very 
lucky to be part of this community and to be sort of learning from this um, from this incredible group. So um, thank you for being here. I wanna say thank you in particular to FAS, uh, to Erica, Jordan and Alice um, and Vijay uh, for being really incredible thought partners in the creation of this event, um, as well as operationally welcoming us to DC, to Optica. So thank you for, um, for all of the support. Um, and I wanna say thanks also to all of our speakers and panelists uh, for your energy, for your contributions today. It's been, um, it's been fantastic. Um, I'm so thrilled that we figured out enough about the um, sort of AV situation that we recorded a lot of these things so we can um, share them out if you're interested afterward. We really, you know, we started the day looking way, way back in time. You know, we began sort of 3.4 billion years ago. <laughs> we talked about sort of the history of learning intelligence, uh, intelligent adaptation, the role of forecasting. And we started actually saying, and this is the trajectory that we're on. So we sort of began talking about the trajectory of AI and we're ending here with this, with this conversation about, where, about AI and where it's going. We looked at model, uh, modeling, um, the impacts of different strategies, uh, decision-making under uh, deep uncertainty, improving our strategies, making them more robust um, to different types of risks with Rob. Uh, we went to Joshua at DARPA, um, who was talking about encoding mental models, the mental models of planners into an actual computational substrate that we can use, bring across our, 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 as an artifact in our, um, in our operations. We learned about space and earthquake now casting, which I honestly had no idea were related. Um, we, uh, we then uh, learned from Alice about um, climate tipping points and conditional forecasting to inform policymaking in the climate space. Uh, Dan shared four pathways to integrating forecasting into the policymaking process. Um, we heard from Brian about blending human judgment and computational modeling. Um, on our communications panel earlier, we talked about sort of the um, balance point between humility and confidence and how we communicate and what are the different trade-offs that we face there and how do we sort of think about the culture of forecasting in our community and the culture of how do we translate in, the, in, a, in, a, in the, a useful way to decision makers. Um, and in our last session here, we've learned about our future AI overlords that are gonna take all of our jobs. Um, I mean, collaborate with us <laughs> as we advance the field of forecasting. So it's been a wild ride. Um, we have a lot to sort of reflect on. And, um, and, I, and I hope, my, my, my hope is that you've left us some post-it notes um, around what do you want out of this community going forward? How, do you, how would you like to sort of see this community develop and evolve um, over time, if we do something like this again, was it useful? What are the things that that you'd like to see? Um, who else should be included and invited to to speak, um, to participate? Um, who are people that you want to learn from in this space? Um, and I love the sort of you know really cross disciplinary, rich environment that we're creating together. So, um, with that, I don't want to. I no longer wish to stand between you and a well deserved celebratory cocktail. So let's transition to the next phase of our evening. Um, thank you everyone for, for being with us today.